These are the names of the Israelites who went to Egypt with Jacob, each bringing his family members. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah. Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin. Dan and Naphtali, Gad and Asher. Seventy persons in all generated by Jacob's seed. Joseph was already in Egypt. Then Joseph died, and all his brothers, that whole generation. But the children of Israel kept on reproducing. They were very prolific, a population explosion in their own right, and the land was filled with them. A new king came to power in Egypt who didn't know Joseph. He spoke to his people with alarm, there are way too many of these Israelites for us to handle. We've got to do something, let's devise a plan to contain them, lest if there's a war they should join our enemies, or just walk off and leave us. So they organized them into work gangs and put them to hard labor under gang foremen. They built the storage cities Pitham and Ramesses for Pharaoh. But the harder the Egyptians worked them the more children the Israelites had, children everywhere. The Egyptians got so they couldn't stand the Israelites and treated them worse than ever, crushing them with slave labor. They made them miserable with hard labor, making bricks and mortar and backbreaking work in the fields. They piled on the work, crushing them under the cruel workload. The king of Egypt had a talk with the two Hebrew midwives, one was named Shifra and the other Pua. He said, when you deliver the Hebrew women, look at the sex of the baby. If it's a boy, kill him, if it's a girl, let her live. But the midwives had far too much respect for God and didn't do what the king of Egypt ordered, they let the boy babies live. The king of Egypt called in the midwives. Why didn't you obey my orders? You've let those babies live. The midwives answered Pharaoh, the Hebrew women aren't like the Egyptian women, they're vigorous. Before the midwife can get there, they've already had the baby. God was pleased with the midwives. The people continued to increase in number, a very strong people. And because the midwives honored God, God gave them families of their own. So Pharaoh issued a general order to all his people, every boy that is born, drown him in the Nile. But let the girls live. A man from the family of Levi married a Levite woman. The woman became pregnant and had a son. She saw there was something special about him and hid him. She hid him for three months. When she couldn't hide him any longer she got a little basket boat made of papyrus, waterproofed it with tar and pitch, and placed the child in it. Then she set it afloat in the reeds at the edge of the Nile. The baby's older sister found herself a vantage point a little way off and watched to see what would happen to him. Pharaoh's daughter came down to the Nile to bathe her maiden strolled on the bank. She saw the basket boat floating in the reeds and sent her maid to get it. She opened it and saw the child, a baby crying. Her heart went out to him. She said, this must be one of the Hebrew babies. Then his sister was before her, do you want me to go and get a nursing mother from the Hebrews so she can nurse the baby for you? Pharaoh's daughter said, Yes. Go. The girl went and called the child's mother. Pharaoh's daughter told her, Take this baby and nurse him for me. I'll pay you. The woman took the child and nursed him. After the child was weaned, she presented him to Pharaoh's daughter who adopted him as her son. She named him Moses, pulled out, saying, I pulled him out of the water. Time passed. Moses grew up. One day he went and saw his brothers, saw all that hard labor. Then he saw an Egyptian hit a Hebrew, one of his relatives. 
He looked this way and then that, when he realized there was no one in sight, he killed the Egyptian and buried him in the sand. The next day he went out there again. Two Hebrew men were fighting. He spoke to the man who started it, why are you hitting your neighbor? The man shot back, who do you think you are, telling us what to do? Are you going to kill me the way you killed that Egyptian? Then Moses panicked, words gotten out, people know about this. Pharaoh heard about it and tried to kill Moses, but Moses got away to the land of Midian. He sat down by a well. The priest of Midian had seven daughters. They came and drew water, filling the troughs and watering their father's sheep. When some shepherds came and chased the girls off, Moses came to their rescue and helped them water their sheep. When they got home to their father, Ruel, he said, that didn't take long. Why are you back so soon? An Egyptian, they said, rescued us from a bunch of shepherds. Why, he even drew water for us and watered the sheep. He said, so where is he? Why did you leave him behind? Invite him so he can have something to eat with us. Moses agreed to settle down there with the man, who then gave his daughter Zipporah, bird, to him for his wife. She had a son, and Moses named him Gershom, sojourner, saying, I'm a sojourner in a foreign country. Many years later the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned under their slavery and cried out. Their cries for relief from their hard labor ascended to God. God listened to their groanings. God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. God saw what was going on with Israel. God understood. Moses was shepherding the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. He led the flock to the west end of the wilderness and came to the mountain of God, Horeb. The angel of God appeared to him in flames of fire blazing out of the middle of a bush. He looked. The bush was blazing away but it didn't burn up. Moses said, what's going on here? I can't believe this. Amazing. Why doesn't the bush burn up? God saw that he had stopped to look. God called to him from out of the bush, Moses. Moses. He said, yes. I'm right here. God said, don't come any closer. Remove your sandals from your feet. You're standing on holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Moses hid his face, afraid to look at God. God said, I've taken a good, long look at the affliction of my people in Egypt. I've heard their cries for deliverance from their slave masters, I know all about their pain. And now I have come down to help them, pry them loose from the grip of Egypt, get them out of that country and bring them to a good land with wide open spaces, a land lush with milk and honey, the land of the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Amorite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite. The Israelite cry for help has come to me, and I've seen for myself how cruelly they're being treated by the Egyptians. It's time for you to go back, I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the people of Israel, out of Egypt. Moses answered God, but why me? What makes you think that I could ever go to Pharaoh and lead the children of Israel out of Egypt? I'll be with you, God said. And this will be the proof that I am the one who sent you, when you have brought my people out of Egypt, you will worship God right here at this very mountain. Then Moses said to God, Suppose I go to the people of Israel and I tell them, The God of your father sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What do I tell them? God said to Moses, 
A-M-W-H-O-A-M. Tell the people of Israel, A-M sent me to you. God continued with Moses, This is what you're to say to the Israelites, God, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob sent me to you. This has always been my name, and this is how I always will be known. Now be on your way. Gather the leaders of Israel. Tell them, God, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, appeared to me, saying, I've looked into what's being done to you in Egypt, and I've determined to get you out of the affliction of Egypt and take you to the land of the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Amorite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite, a land brimming over with milk and honey. Believe me, they will listen to you. Then you and the leaders of Israel will go to the king of Egypt and say to him, God, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us. Let us take a three-day journey into the wilderness where we will worship God, our God. I know that the king of Egypt won't let you go unless forced to, so I'll intervene and hit Egypt where it hurts, oh, my miracles will send them reeling, after which they'll be glad to send you off. I'll see to it that this people get a hearty send-off by the Egyptians, when you leave, you won't leave empty-handed. Each woman will ask her neighbor and any guests in her house for objects of silver and gold, for jewelry, and extra clothes, you'll put them on your sons and daughters. Oh, you'll clean the Egyptians out. Moses objected, they won't trust me. They won't listen to a word I say. They're going to say, God. Appear to him. Hardly. So God said, what's that in your hand? A staff. Throw it on the ground. He threw it. It became a snake, Moses jumped back, fast. God said to Moses, reach out and grab it by the tail. He reached out and grabbed it, and he was holding his staff again. That's so they will trust that God appeared to you, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God then said, put your hand inside your shirt. He slipped his hand under his shirt, then took it out. His hand had turned leprous, like snow. He said, put your hand back under your shirt. He did it, then took it back out, as healthy as before. So if they don't trust you and aren't convinced by the first sign, the second sign should do it. But if it doesn't, if even after these two signs they don't trust you and listen to your message, take some water out of the Nile and pour it out on the dry land, the Nile water that you pour out will turn to blood when it hits the ground. Moses raised another objection to God, Master, please, I don't talk well. I've never been good with words, neither before nor after you spoke to me. I stutter and stammer. God said, And who do you think made the human mouth? And who makes some mute, some deaf, some sighted, some blind? Isn't it I, God? So, get going. I'll be right there with you, with your mouth. I'll be right there to teach you what to say. He said, Oh, Master, please. Send somebody else. God got angry with Moses, don't you have a brother, Aaron the Levite? He's good with words, I know he is. He speaks very well. In fact, at this very moment he's on his way to meet you. When he sees you he's going to be glad. You'll speak to him and tell him what to say. I'll be right there with you as you speak and with him as he speaks, teaching you step by step. He will speak to the people for you. He'll act as your mouth, but you'll decide what comes out of it. Now take this staff in your hand, you'll use it to do the signs. Moses went back to Jethro his father-in-law and said, 
I need to return to my relatives who are in Egypt. I want to see if they're still alive. Jethro said, Go. And peace be with you. God said to Moses in Midian, Go. Return to Egypt. All the men who wanted to kill you are dead. So Moses took his wife and sons and put them on a donkey for the return trip to Egypt. He had a firm grip on the staff of God. God said to Moses, When you get back to Egypt, be prepared, all the wonders that I will do through you, you'll do before Pharaoh. But I will make him stubborn so that he will refuse to let the people go. Then you are to tell Pharaoh, God's message, Israel is my son, my firstborn. I told you, free my son so that he can serve me. But you refuse to free him. So now I'm going to kill your son, your firstborn. On the journey back, as they camped for the night, God met Moses and would have killed him but Zipporah took a flint knife and cut off her son's foreskin, and touched Moses' member with it. She said, Oh! You're a bridegroom of blood to me. Then God let him go. She used the phrase, bridegroom of blood, because of the circumcision. God spoke to Aaron, Go and meet Moses in the wilderness. He went and met him at the mountain of God and kissed him. Moses told Aaron the message that God had sent him to speak and the wonders he had commanded him to do. So Moses and Aaron proceeded to round up all the leaders of Israel. Aaron told them everything that God had told Moses and demonstrated the wonders before the people. And the people trusted and listened believingly that God was concerned with what was going on with the Israelites and knew all about their affliction. They bowed low and they worshipped. After that Moses and Aaron approached Pharaoh. They said, God, the God of Israel, says, Free my people so that they can hold a festival for me in the wilderness. Pharaoh said, And who is God that I should listen to him and send Israel off? I know nothing of this so-called God, and I'm certainly not going to send Israel off. They said, The God of the Hebrews has met with us. Let us take a three-day journey into the wilderness so we can worship our God lest he strike us with either disease or death. But the king of Egypt said, Why on earth, Moses and Aaron, would you suggest the people be given a holiday? Back to work. Pharaoh went on, Look, I've got all these people freeloading and now you want to reward them with time off. Pharaoh took immediate action. He sent down orders to the slave drivers and their underlings, don't provide straw for the people for making bricks as you have been doing. Make them get their own straw. And make them produce the same number of bricks, no reduction in their daily quotas. They're getting lazy. They're going around saying, Give us time off so we can worship our God. Crack down on them. That'll cure them of their whining, their God fantasies. The slave drivers and their underlings went out to the people with their new instructions. Pharaoh's orders, no more straw provided. Get your own straw wherever you can find it. And not one brick less in your daily work quota. The people scattered all over Egypt scrambling for straw. The slave drivers were merciless, saying, Complete your daily quota of bricks, the same number as when you were given straw. The Israelite foremen whom the slave drivers had appointed were beaten and badgered. Why didn't you finish your quota of bricks yesterday or the day before, and now again today? The Israelite foreman came to Pharaoh and cried out for relief, Why are you treating your servants like this? Nobody gives us any straw and they tell us, Make bricks. Look at us, we're being beaten. And it's not our fault. But Pharaoh said, Lazy. That's what you are. 
lazy. That's why you whine, let us go so we can worship God. Well then, go, go back to work. Nobody's going to give you straw, and at the end of the day you better bring in your full quota of bricks. The Israelite foreman saw that they were in a bad way, having to go back and tell their workers, not one brick short in your daily quota. As they left Pharaoh, they found Moses and Aaron waiting to meet them. The foreman said to them, May God see what you've done and judge you, you've made us stink before Pharaoh and his servants. You've put a weapon in his hand that's going to kill us. Moses went back to God and said, My master, why are you treating this people so badly? And why did you ever send me? From the moment I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, things have only gotten worse for this people. And rescue? Does this look like rescue to you? God said to Moses, Now you'll see what I'll do to Pharaoh, with a strong hand he'll send them out free, with a strong hand he'll drive them out of his land. God continued speaking to Moses, reassuring him, I am God. I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as the strong God, but by my name God, I am present, I was not known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the country in which they lived as sojourners. But now I've heard the groanings of the Israelites whom the Egyptians continue to enslave and I've remembered my covenant. Therefore tell the Israelites. I am God. I will bring you out from under the cruel hard labor of Egypt. I will rescue you from slavery. I will redeem you, intervening with great acts of judgment. I'll take you as my own people and I'll be God to you. You'll know that I am God, your God who brings you out from under the cruel hard labor of Egypt. I'll bring you into the land that I promised to give Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and give it to you as your own country. I am God. But when Moses delivered this message to the Israelites, they didn't even hear him, they were that beaten down in spirit by the harsh slave conditions. Then God said to Moses, Go and speak to Pharaoh king of Egypt so that he will release the Israelites from his land. Moses answered God, Look, the Israelites won't even listen to me. How do you expect Pharaoh to? And besides, I stutter. But God again laid out the facts to Moses and Aaron regarding the Israelites and Pharaoh king of Egypt, and he again commanded them to lead the Israelites out of the land of Egypt. These are the heads of the tribes. The sons of Reuben, Israel's firstborn, Hanak, Palu, Hezron, and Carmi, these are the families of Reuben. The sons of Simeon, Jemuel, Jamin, Ohad, Jachin, Zohar, and Saul, the son of a Canaanite woman, these are the families of Simeon. These are the names of the sons of Levi in the order of their birth, Gershon, Kohath, and Merari. Levi lived 137 years. The sons of Gershon by family, Libni and Shimi. The sons of Kohath, Amram, Izar, Hebron, and Uzziel. Kohath lived to be 133. The sons of Merari, Mali and Mushi. These are the sons of Levi in the order of their birth. Umram married his aunt Jochebed and she had Aaron and Moses. Umram lived to be 137. The sons of Azar, Korah, Nepheg, and Zikri. The sons of Uzziel, Mishael, Elzaphan, and Sithri. Aaron married Elisheba, the daughter of Ammonadab and sister of Nashon, and she had Nadab and Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar. The sons of Korah, Asur, Elkanah, and Abiasaph. These are the families of the Korahites. Aaron's son Eleazar married one of the daughters of Pudiel and she had Phinehas. 
These are the heads of the Levite families, family by family. This is the Aaron and Moses whom God ordered, Bring the Israelites out of the land of Egypt clan by clan. These are the men, Moses and Aaron, who told Pharaoh king of Egypt to release the Israelites from Egypt. And that's how things stood when God next spoke to Moses in Egypt. God addressed Moses, saying, I am God. Tell Pharaoh king of Egypt everything I say to you. And Moses answered, Look at me. I stutter. Why would Pharaoh listen to me? God told Moses, Look at me. I'll make you as a god to Pharaoh and your brother Aaron will be your prophet. You are to speak everything I command you, and your brother Aaron will tell it to Pharaoh. Then he will release the Israelites from his land. At the same time I am going to put Pharaoh's back up and follow it up by filling Egypt with signs and wonders. Pharaoh is not going to listen to you, but I will have my way against Egypt and bring out my soldiers, my people the Israelites, from Egypt by mighty acts of judgment. The Egyptians will realize that I am God when I step in and take the Israelites out of their country. Moses and Aaron did exactly what God commanded. Moses was 80 and Aaron 83 when they spoke to Pharaoh. Then God spoke to Moses and Aaron. He said, When Pharaoh speaks to you and says, Prove yourselves. Perform a miracle, then tell Aaron, Take your staff and throw it down in front of Pharaoh, it will turn into a snake. Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did what God commanded. Aaron threw his staff down in front of Pharaoh and his servants, and it turned into a snake. Pharaoh called in his wise men and sorcerers. The magicians of Egypt did the same thing by their spells, each man threw down his staff and they all turned into snakes. But then Aaron's staff swallowed their staffs. Yet Pharaoh was as stubborn as ever, he wouldn't listen to them, just as God had said. God said to Moses, Pharaoh is a stubborn man. He refuses to release the people. First thing in the morning, go and meet Pharaoh as he goes down to the river. At the shore of the Nile take the staff that turned into a snake and say to him, God, the God of the Hebrews, sent me to you with this message, release my people so that they can worship me in the wilderness. So far you haven't listened. This is how you'll know that I am God. I am going to take this staff that I'm holding and strike this Nile River water, the water will turn to blood, the fish in the Nile will die, the Nile will stink, and the Egyptians won't be able to drink the Nile water. God said to Moses, Tell Aaron, Take your staff and wave it over the waters of Egypt, over its rivers, its canals, its ponds, all its bodies of water, so that they turn to blood. There'll be blood everywhere in Egypt, even in the pots and pans. Moses and Aaron did exactly as God commanded them. Aaron raised his staff and hit the water in the Nile with Pharaoh and his servants watching. All the water in the Nile turned into blood. The fish in the Nile died, the Nile stank, and the Egyptians couldn't drink the Nile water. The blood was everywhere in Egypt. But the magicians of Egypt did the same thing with their incantations. Still Pharaoh remained stubborn. He wouldn't listen to them as God had said. He spun around and went home, never giving it a second thought. But all the Egyptians had to dig inland from the river for water because they couldn't drink the Nile water. Seven days went by after God had struck the Nile. God said to Moses, Go to Pharaoh and tell him, God's message, release my people so they can worship me. If you refuse to release them, I'm warning you, I'll hit the whole country with frogs. The Nile will swarm with frogs, they'll come up into your houses, into your bedrooms and into your beds, 
into your servants' quarters, among the people, into your ovens and pots and pans. They'll be all over you, all over everyone, frogs everywhere, on and in everything. God said to Moses, Tell Aaron, Wave your staff over the rivers and canals and ponds. Bring up frogs on the land of Egypt. Aaron stretched his staff over the waters of Egypt and a mob of frogs came up and covered the country. But again the magicians did the same thing using their incantations, they also produced frogs in Egypt. Pharaoh called in Moses and Aaron and said, Pray to God to rid us of these frogs. I'll release the people so that they can make their sacrifices and worship God. Moses said to Pharaoh, Certainly. Set the time. When do you want the frogs out of here, away from your servants and people and out of your houses? You'll be rid of frogs except for those in the Nile. Make it tomorrow. Moses said, Tomorrow it is, so you'll realize that there is no God like our God. The frogs will be gone. You and your houses and your servants and your people, free of frogs. The only frogs left will be the ones in the Nile. Moses and Aaron left Pharaoh, and Moses prayed to God about the frogs he had brought on Pharaoh. God responded to Moses' prayer, the frogs died off, houses, courtyards, fields, all free of frogs. They piled the frogs in heaps. The country reeked of dead frogs. But when Pharaoh saw that he had some breathing room, he got stubborn again and wouldn't listen to Moses and Aaron. Just as God had said. God said to Moses, Tell Aaron, take your staff and strike the dust. The dust will turn into gnats all over Egypt. He did it. Aaron grabbed his staff and struck the dust of the earth. It turned into gnats, gnats all over people and animals. All the dust of the earth turned into gnats, gnats everywhere in Egypt. The magicians tried to produce gnats with their spells but this time they couldn't do it. There were gnats everywhere, all over people and animals. The magician said to Pharaoh, this is God's doing. But Pharaoh was stubborn and wouldn't listen. Just as God had said. God said to Moses, Get up early in the morning and confront Pharaoh as he goes down to the water. Tell him, God's message, Release my people so they can worship me. If you don't release my people, I'll release swarms of flies on you, your servants, your people, and your homes. The houses of the Egyptians and even the ground under their feet will be thick with flies. But when it happens, I'll set Goshen where my people live aside as a sanctuary, no flies in Goshen. That will show you that I am God in this land. I'll make a sharp distinction between your people and mine. This sign will occur tomorrow. And God did just that. Thick swarms of flies in Pharaoh's palace and the houses of his servants. All over Egypt, the country ruined by flies. Pharaoh called in Moses and Aaron and said, Go ahead. Sacrifice to your God, but do it here in this country. Moses said, That would not be wise. What we sacrifice to our God would give great offense to Egyptians. If we openly sacrifice what is so deeply offensive to Egyptians, they'll kill us. Let us go three days' journey into the wilderness and sacrifice to our God, just as he instructed us. Pharaoh said, All right. I'll release you to go and sacrifice to your God in the wilderness. Only don't go too far. Now pray for me. Moses said, As soon as I leave here, I will pray to God that tomorrow the flies will leave Pharaoh, his servants, and his people. But don't play games with us and change your mind about releasing us to sacrifice to God. 
Moses left Pharaoh and prayed to God. God did what Moses asked. He got rid of the flies from Pharaoh and his servants and his people. There wasn't a fly left. But Pharaoh became stubborn once again and wouldn't release the people. God said to Moses, Go to Pharaoh and tell him, God, the God of the Hebrews, says, Release my people so they can worship me. If you refuse to release them and continue to hold on to them, I'm giving you fair warning. God will come down hard on your livestock out in the fields, horses, donkeys, camels, cattle, sheep, striking them with a severe disease. God will draw a sharp line between the livestock of Israel and the livestock of Egypt. Not one animal that belongs to the Israelites will die. Then God set the time, tomorrow God will do this thing. And the next day God did it. All the livestock of Egypt died, but not one animal of the Israelites died. Pharaoh sent men to find out what had happened and there it was, none of the livestock of the Israelites had died, not one death. But Pharaoh stayed stubborn. He wouldn't release the people. God said to Moses and Aaron, Take fistfuls of soot from a furnace and have Moses throw it into the air right before Pharaoh's eyes, it will become a film of fine dust all over Egypt and cause sores, an eruption of boils on people and animals throughout Egypt. So they took soot from a furnace, stood in front of Pharaoh, and threw it up into the air. It caused boils to erupt on people and animals. The magicians weren't able to compete with Moses this time because of the boils, they were covered with boils just like everyone else in Egypt. God hardened Pharaoh in his stubbornness. He wouldn't listen, just as God had said to Moses. God said to Moses, Get up early in the morning and confront Pharaoh. Tell him, God, the God of the Hebrews, says, Release my people so they can worship me. This time I am going to strike you and your servants and your people with the full force of my power so you'll get it into your head that there's no one like me anywhere in all the earth. You know that by now I could have struck you and your people with deadly disease and there would be nothing left of you, not a trace. But for one reason only I have kept you on your feet, to make you recognize my power so that my reputation spreads in all the earth. You are still building yourself up at my people's expense. You are not letting them go. So here's what's going to happen, at this time tomorrow I'm sending a terrific hailstorm, there's never been a storm like this in Egypt from the day of its founding until now. So get your livestock under roof, everything exposed in the open fields, people and animals, will die when the hail comes down. All of Pharaoh's servants who had respect for God's word got their workers and animals under cover as fast as they could, but those who didn't take God's word seriously left their workers and animals out in the field. God said to Moses, Stretch your hands to the skies. Signal the hail to fall all over Egypt on people and animals and crops exposed in the fields of Egypt. Moses lifted his staff to the skies and God sent cracks of thunder and hail shot through with lightning strikes. God rained hail down on the land of Egypt. The hail came, hail and lightning, a fierce hailstorm. There had been nothing like it in Egypt in its entire history. The hail hit hard all over Egypt. Everything exposed out in the fields, people and animals and crops, was smashed. Even the trees in the fields were shattered. Except for Goshen where the Israelites lived, there was no hail in Goshen. Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron. He said, I've sinned for sure this time, God is in the right and I and my people are in the wrong. Pray to God. We've had enough of God's thunder and hail. I'll let you go. The sooner you're out of here the better. 
Moses said, As soon as I'm out of the city, I'll stretch out my arms to God. The thunder will stop and the hail end so you'll know that the land is God's land. Still, I know that you and your servants have no respect for God. The flax and the barley were ruined, for they were just ripening, but the wheat and spelt weren't hurt, they ripen later. Moses left Pharaoh and the city and stretched out his arms to God. The thunder and hail stopped, the storm cleared. But when Pharaoh saw that the rain and hail and thunder had stopped, he kept right on sinning, stubborn as ever, both he and his servants. Pharaoh's heart turned rock hard. He refused to release the Israelites, as God had ordered through Moses. God said to Moses, Go to Pharaoh. I've made him stubborn, him and his servants, so that I can force him to look at these signs and so you'll be able to tell your children and grandchildren how I toyed with the Egyptians, like a cat with a mouse, you'll tell them the stories of the signs that I brought down on them, so that you'll all know that I am God. Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said to him, God, the God of the Hebrews, says, how long are you going to refuse to knuckle under? Release my people so that they can worship me. If you refuse to release my people, watch out, tomorrow I'm bringing locusts into your country. They'll cover every square inch of ground, no one will be able to see the ground. They'll devour everything left over from the hailstorm, even the saplings out in the fields, they'll clear-cut the trees. And they'll invade your houses, filling the houses of your servants, filling every house in Egypt. Nobody will have ever seen anything like this, from the time your ancestors first set foot on this soil until today. Then he turned on his heel and left Pharaoh. Pharaoh's servants said to him, How long are you going to let this man harass us? Let these people go and worship their God. Can't you see that Egypt is on its last legs? So Moses and Aaron were brought back to Pharaoh. He said to them, Go ahead then. Go worship your God. But just who exactly is going with you? Moses said, We're taking young and old, sons and daughters, flocks and herds, this is our worship celebration of God. He said, I'd sooner send you off with God's blessings than let you go with your children. Look, you're up to no good, it's written all over your faces. No way. Just the men are going, go ahead and worship God. That's what you want so badly. And they were thrown out of Pharaoh's presence. God said to Moses, Stretch your hand over Egypt and signal the locusts to cover the land of Egypt, devouring every blade of grass in the country, everything that the hail didn't get. Moses stretched out his staff over the land of Egypt. God let loose an east wind. It blew that day and night. By morning the east wind had brought in the locusts. The locusts covered the country of Egypt, settling over every square inch of Egypt, the place was thick with locusts. There never was an invasion of locusts like it in the past, and never will be again. The ground was completely covered, black with locusts. They ate everything, every blade of grass, every piece of fruit, anything that the hail didn't get. Nothing left but bare trees and bare fields, not a sign of green in the whole land of Egypt. Pharaoh had Moses and Aaron back in no time. He said, I've sinned against your God and against you. Overlook my sin one more time. Pray to your God to get me out of this, get death out of here. Moses left Pharaoh and prayed to God. God reversed the wind, a powerful west wind took the locusts and dumped them into the Red Sea. There wasn't a single locust left in the whole country of Egypt. But God made Pharaoh stubborn as ever. 
he still didn't release the Israelites. God said to Moses, Stretch your hand to the skies. Let darkness descend on the land of Egypt, a darkness so dark you can touch it. Moses stretched out his hand to the skies. Thick darkness descended on the land of Egypt for three days. Nobody could see anybody. For three days no one could so much as move. Except for the Israelites, they had light where they were living. Pharaoh called in Moses, Go and worship God. Leave your flocks and herds behind. But go ahead and take your children. But Moses said, you have to let us take our sacrificial animals and offerings with us so we can sacrifice them in worship to our God. Our livestock has to go with us with not a hoof left behind, they are part of the worship of our God. And we don't know just what will be needed until we get there. But God kept Pharaoh stubborn as ever. He wouldn't agree to release them. Pharaoh said to Moses, get out of my sight. And watch your step. I don't want to ever see you again. If I lay eyes on you again, you're dead. Moses said, have it your way. You won't see my face again. God said to Moses, I'm going to hit Pharaoh in Egypt one final time, and then he'll let you go. When he releases you, that will be the end of Egypt for you, he won't be able to get rid of you fast enough. So here's what you do. Tell the people to ask, each man from his neighbor and each woman from her neighbor, for things made of silver and gold. God saw to it that the Egyptians liked the people. Also, Moses was greatly admired by the Egyptians, a respected public figure among both Pharaoh's servants and the people at large. Then Moses confronted Pharaoh, God's message, At midnight I will go through Egypt and every firstborn child in Egypt will die, from the firstborn of Pharaoh, who sits on his throne, to the firstborn of the slave girl working at her hand mill. Also the firstborn of animals. Widespread wailing will erupt all over the country, lament such as has never been and never will be again. But against the Israelites, man, woman, or animal, there won't be so much as a dog's bark, so that you'll know that God makes a clear distinction between Egypt and Israel. Then all these servants of yours will grovel before me, begging me to leave, leave. You and all the people who follow you. And I will most certainly leave. Moses, seething with anger, left Pharaoh. God said to Moses, Pharaoh's not going to listen to a thing you say so that the signs of my presence and work are going to multiply in the land of Egypt. Moses and Aaron had performed all these signs in Pharaoh's presence, but God turned Pharaoh more stubborn than ever, yet again he refused to release the Israelites from his land. God said to Moses and Aaron while still in Egypt, this month is to be the first month of the year for you. Address the whole community of Israel, tell them that on the tenth of this month each man is to take a lamb for his family, one lamb to a house. If the family is too small for a lamb, then share it with a close neighbor, depending on the number of persons involved. Be mindful of how much each person will eat. Your lamb must be a healthy male, one year old, you can select it from either the sheep or the goats. Keep it penned until the fourteenth day of this month and then slaughter it, the entire community of Israel will do this, at dusk. Then take some of the blood and smear it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which you will eat it. You are to eat the meat, roasted in the fire, that night, along with bread, made without yeast, and bitter herbs. Don't eat any of it raw or boiled in water, make sure it's roasted, the whole animal, head, legs, and innards. Don't leave any of it until morning, if there are leftovers, burn them in the fire. 
And here is how you are to eat it, be fully dressed with your sandals on and your stick in your hand. Eat in a hurry, it's the Passover to God. I will go through the land of Egypt on this night and strike down every firstborn in the land of Egypt, whether human or animal, and bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am God. The blood will serve as a sign on the houses where you live. When I see the blood I will pass over you, no disaster will touch you when I strike the land of Egypt. This will be a memorial day for you, you will celebrate it as a festival to God down through the generations, a fixed festival celebration to be observed always. You will eat unraised bread, matzot, for seven days, on the first day get rid of all yeast from your houses, anyone who eats anything with yeast from the first day to the seventh day will be cut off from Israel. The first and the seventh days are set aside as holy, do no work on those days. Only what you have to do for meals, each person can do that. Keep the festival of unraised bread. This marks the exact day I brought you out in force from the land of Egypt. Honor the day down through your generations, a fixed festival to be observed always. In the first month, beginning on the fourteenth day at evening until the twenty-first day at evening, you are to eat unraised bread. For those seven days not a trace of yeast is to be found in your houses. Anyone, whether a visitor or a native of the land, who eats anything raised shall be cut off from the community of Israel. Don't eat anything raised. Only matzot. Moses assembled all the elders of Israel. He said, Select a lamb for your families and slaughter the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the bowl of blood and smear it on the lintel and on the two doorposts. No one is to leave the house until morning. God will pass through to strike Egypt down. When he sees the blood on the lintel and the two doorposts, God will pass over the doorway, he won't let the destroyer enter your house to strike you down with ruin. Keep this word. It's the law for you and your children, forever. When you enter the land which God will give you as he promised, keep doing this. And when your children say to you, why are we doing this, tell them, it's the Passover sacrifice to God who passed over the homes of the Israelites in Egypt when he hit Egypt with death but rescued us. The people bowed and worshipped. The Israelites then went and did what God had commanded Moses and Aaron. They did it all. At midnight God struck every firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh, who sits on his throne, right down to the firstborn of the prisoner locked up in jail. Also the firstborn of the animals. Pharaoh got up that night, he and all his servants and everyone else in Egypt, what wild wailing and lament in Egypt. There wasn't a house in which someone wasn't dead. Pharaoh called in Moses and Aaron that very night and said, Get out of here and be done with you, you and your Israelites. Go worship God on your own terms. And yes, take your sheep and cattle as you've insisted, but go. And bless me. The Egyptians couldn't wait to get rid of them, they pushed them to hurry up, saying, we're all as good as dead. The people grabbed their bread dough before it had risen, bundled their bread bowls in their cloaks and threw them over their shoulders. The Israelites had already done what Moses had told them, they had asked the Egyptians for silver and gold things and clothing. God saw to it that the Egyptians liked the people and so readily gave them what they asked for. Oh yes! They picked those Egyptians clean. The Israelites moved on from Ramesses to Sukkot, about 600,000 on foot, besides their dependents. Hebrews and non-Hebrews alike set out, not to mention the large flocks and herds of livestock. 
They baked unraised cakes with the bread dough they had brought out of Egypt, it hadn't raised, they'd been rushed out of Egypt and hadn't time to fix food for the journey. The Israelites had lived in Egypt 430 years. At the end of the 430 years, to the very day, God's entire army left Egypt. God kept watch all night, watching over the Israelites as he brought them out of Egypt. Because God kept watch, all Israel for all generations will honor God by keeping watch this night, a watch night. God said to Moses and Aaron, These are the rules for the Passover. No foreigners are to eat it. Any slave, if he's paid for and circumcised, can eat it. No casual visitor or hired hand can eat it. Eat it in one house, don't take the meat outside the house. Don't break any of the bones. The whole community of Israel is to be included in the meal. If an immigrant is staying with you and wants to keep the Passover to God, every male in his family must be circumcised, then he can participate in the meal, he will then be treated as a native son. But no uncircumcised person can eat it. The same law applies both to the native and the immigrant who is staying with you. All the Israelites did exactly as God commanded Moses and Aaron. That very day God brought the Israelites out of the land of Egypt, tribe by tribe. God spoke to Moses, saying, Set apart every firstborn to me, the first one to come from the womb among the Israelites, whether person or animal, is mine. Moses said to the people, Always remember this day. This is the day when you came out of Egypt from a house of slavery. God brought you out of here with a powerful hand. Don't eat any raised bread. You are leaving in the spring month of Abib. When God brings you into the land of the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Amorite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite, which he promised to your fathers to give you, a land lavish with milk and honey, you are to observe this service during this month. You are to eat unraised bread for seven days, on the seventh day there is a festival celebration to God. Only unraised bread is to be eaten for seven days. There is not to be a trace of anything fermented, no yeast anywhere. Tell your child on that day, this is because of what God did for me when I came out of Egypt. The day of observance will be like a sign on your hand, a memorial between your eyes, and the teaching of God in your mouth. It was with a powerful hand that God brought you out of Egypt. Follow these instructions at the set time, year after year after year. When God brings you into the land of the Canaanites, as he promised you and your fathers, and turns it over to you, you are to set aside the first birth out of every womb to God. Every first birth from your livestock belongs to God. You can redeem every first birth of a donkey if you want to by substituting a lamb, if you decide not to redeem it, you must break its neck. Redeem every firstborn child among your sons. When the time comes and your son asks you, what does this mean, you tell him, God brought us out of Egypt, out of a house of slavery, with a powerful hand. When Pharaoh stubbornly refused to let us go, God killed every firstborn in Egypt, the firstborn of both humans and animals. That's why I make a sacrifice for every first male birth from the womb to God and redeem every firstborn son. The observance functions like a sign on your hands or a symbol on the middle of your forehead, God brought us out of Egypt with a powerful hand. It so happened that after Pharaoh released the people, God didn't lead them by the road through the land of the Philistines, which was the shortest route, for God thought, if the people encounter war, they'll change their minds and go back to Egypt. So God led the people on the wilderness road, looping around to the Red Sea. The Israelites left Egypt in military formation. 
Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for Joseph had made the Israelites solemnly swear to do it, saying, God will surely hold you accountable, so make sure you bring my bones from here with you. They moved on from Sukkot and then camped at Etham at the edge of the wilderness. God went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud during the day to guide them on the way, and at night in a pillar of fire to give them light, thus they could travel both day and night. The pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night never left the people. God spoke to Moses, Tell the Israelites to turn around and make camp at pi Hahirath, between Migdal and the sea. Camp on the shore of the sea opposite Baal Zephon. Pharaoh will think, the Israelites are lost, they're confused. The wilderness has closed in on them. Then I'll make Pharaoh's heart stubborn again and he'll chase after them. And I'll use Pharaoh and his army to put my glory on display. Then the Egyptians will realize that I am God. And that's what happened. When the king of Egypt was told that the people were gone, he and his servants changed their minds. They said, What have we done, letting Israel, our slave labor, go free? So he had his chariots harnessed up and got his army together. He took six hundred of his best chariots, with the rest of the Egyptian chariots and their drivers coming along. God made Pharaoh king of Egypt stubborn, determined to chase the Israelites as they walked out on him without even looking back. The Egyptians gave chase and caught up with them where they had made camp by the sea, all Pharaoh's horse-drawn chariots and their riders, all his foot soldiers there at Pi Hahirath opposite Baal Zephon. As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up and saw them, Egyptians, coming at them. They were totally afraid. They cried out in terror to God. They told Moses, weren't the cemeteries large enough in Egypt so that you had to take us out here in the wilderness to die? What have you done to us, taking us out of Egypt? Back in Egypt didn't we tell you this would happen? Didn't we tell you, leave us alone here in Egypt, we're better off as slaves in Egypt than as corpses in the wilderness. Moses spoke to the people, don't be afraid. Stand firm and watch God do his work of salvation for you today. Take a good look at the Egyptians today for you're never going to see them again. God will fight the battle for you. And you. You keep your mouth shut. God said to Moses, Why cry out to me? Speak to the Israelites. Order them to get moving. Hold your staff high and stretch your hand out over the sea, split the sea. The Israelites will walk through the sea on dry ground. Meanwhile I'll make sure the Egyptians keep up their stubborn chase, I'll use Pharaoh and his entire army his chariots and horsemen, to put my glory on display so that the Egyptians will realize that I am God. The angel of God that had been leading the camp of Israel now shifted and got behind them. And the pillar of cloud that had been in front also shifted to the rear. The cloud was now between the camp of Egypt and the camp of Israel. The cloud enshrouded one camp in darkness and flooded the other with light. The two camps didn't come near each other all night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and God, with a terrific east wind all night long, made the sea go back. He made the sea dry ground. The sea waters split. The Israelites walked through the sea on dry ground with the waters a wall to the right and to the left. The Egyptians came after them in full pursuit, every horse and chariot and driver of Pharaoh racing into the middle of the sea. It was now the morning watch. God looked down from the pillar of fire and cloud on the Egyptian army and threw them into a panic. He clogged the wheels of their chariots they were stuck in the mud. The Egyptians said, 
run from Israel. God is fighting on their side and against Egypt. God said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea and the waters will come back over the Egyptians, over their chariots, over their horsemen. Moses stretched his hand out over the sea, as the day broke and the Egyptians were running, the sea returned to its place as before. God dumped the Egyptians in the middle of the sea. The waters returned, drowning the chariots and riders of Pharaoh's army that had chased after Israel into the sea. Not one of them survived. But the Israelites walked right through the middle of the sea on dry ground, the waters forming a wall to the right and to the left. God delivered Israel that day from the oppression of the Egyptians. And Israel looked at the Egyptian dead, washed up on the shore of the sea, and realized the tremendous power that God brought against the Egyptians. The people were in reverent awe before God and trusted in God and his servant Moses. Then Moses and the Israelites sang this song to God, giving voice together. I'm singing my heart out to God, what a victory. He pitched horse and rider into the sea. God is my strength, God is my song. And, yes, God is my salvation. This is the kind of God I have. And I'm telling the world. This is the God of my Father. I'm spreading the news far and wide. God is a fighter. Pure God, through and through. Pharaoh's chariots and army. He dumped in the sea. The elite of his officers. He drowned in the Red Sea. Wild ocean waters poured over them. They sank like a rock in the deep blue sea. Your strong right hand, God, shimmers with power. Your strong right hand shatters the enemy. In your mighty majesty. You smash your upstart enemies. You let loose your hot anger. And burn them to a crisp. At a blast from your nostrils. The waters piled up. Tumbling streams dammed up. Wild oceans curdled into a swamp. The enemy spoke. I'll pursue, I'll hunt them down. I'll divide up the plunder. I'll glut myself on them. I'll pull out my sword. My fist will send them reeling. You blew with all your might. And the sea covered them. They sank like a lead weight. In the majestic waters. Who compares with you? Among gods, O oh God. Who compares with you in power? In holy majesty. In awesome praises. Wonder-working God. You stretched out your right hand. And the earth swallowed them up. But the people you redeemed. You led in merciful love. You guided them under your protection. To your holy pasture. When people heard, they were scared. Philistines writhed and trembled. Yes, even the head men in Edom were shaken. And the big bosses in Moab. Everybody in Canaan. Panicked and fell faint. Dread and terror sent them reeling before your brandished right arm. They were struck dumb like a stone until your people crossed over and entered, O oh God. Until the people you made crossed over and entered. You brought them and planted them on the mountain of your heritage, the place where you live, the place you made, your sanctuary, Master, that you established with your own hands. Let God rule. Forever, for eternity. Yes, Pharaoh's horses and chariots and riders went into the sea and God turned the waters back on them, 
but the Israelites walked on dry land right through the middle of the sea. Miriam the prophetess, Aaron's sister, took a tambourine, and all the women followed her with tambourines, dancing. Miriam led them in singing. Sing to God. What a victory! He pitched horse and rider. Into the sea. Moses led Israel from the Red Sea on to the wilderness of Shur. They traveled for three days through the wilderness without finding any water. They got to Mara, but they couldn't drink the water at Mara, it was bitter. That's why they called the place Mara, bitter. And the people complained to Moses, so what are we supposed to drink? So Moses cried out in prayer to God. God pointed him to a stick of wood. Moses threw it into the water and the water turned sweet. That's the place where God set up rules and procedures, that's where he started testing them. God said, if you listen, listen obediently to how God tells you to live in his presence, obeying his commandments and keeping all his laws, then I won't strike you with all the diseases that I inflicted on the Egyptians, I am God your healer. They came to Elim where there were twelve springs of water and seventy palm trees. They set up camp there by the water. On the fifteenth day of the second month after they had left Egypt, the whole company of Israel moved on from Elim to the wilderness of Sin which is between Elim and Sinai. The whole company of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron there in the wilderness. The Israelites said, why didn't God let us die in comfort in Egypt where we had lamb stew and all the bread we could eat? You've brought us out into this wilderness to starve us to death, the whole company of Israel. God said to Moses, I'm going to rain bread down from the skies for you. The people will go out and gather each day's ration. I'm going to test them to see if they'll live according to my teaching or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they have gathered, it will turn out to be twice as much as their daily ration. Moses and Aaron told the people of Israel, This evening you will know that it is God who brought you out of Egypt, and in the morning you will see the glory of God. Yes, he's listened to your complaints against him. You haven't been complaining against us, you know, but against God. Moses said, since it will be God who gives you meat for your meal in the evening and your fill of bread in the morning, it's God who will have listened to your complaints against him. Who are we in all this? You haven't been complaining to us, you've been complaining to God. Moses instructed Aaron, tell the whole company of Israel, come near to God. He's heard your complaints. When Aaron gave out the instructions to the whole company of Israel, they turned to face the wilderness. And there it was, the glory of God visible in the cloud. God spoke to Moses, I've listened to the complaints of the Israelites. Now tell them, at dusk you will eat meat and at dawn you'll eat your fill of bread, and you'll realize that I am God, your God. That evening quail flew in and covered the camp and in the morning there was a layer of dew all over the camp. When the layer of dew had lifted, there on the wilderness ground was a fine flaky something, fine as frost on the ground. The Israelites took one look and said to one another, Man who, what is it? They had no idea what it was. So Moses told them, it's the bread God has given you to eat. And these are God's instructions, gather enough for each person, about two quarts per person, gather enough for everyone in your tent. The people of Israel went to work and started gathering, some more, some less, but when they measured out what they had gathered, those who gathered more had no extra and those who gathered less weren't short, each person had gathered as much as was needed. Moses said to them, Don't leave any of it until morning. But they didn't listen to Moses. A few of the men kept back some of it until morning. 
It got wormy and smelled bad. And Moses lost his temper with them. They gathered it every morning, each person according to need. Then the sun heated up and it melted. On the sixth day they gathered twice as much bread, about four quarts per person. Then the leaders of the company came to Moses and reported. Moses said, This is what God was talking about, tomorrow is a day of rest, a holy Sabbath to God. Whatever you plan to bake, bake today, and whatever you plan to boil, boil today. Then set aside the leftovers until morning. They set aside what was left until morning, as Moses had commanded. It didn't smell bad and there were no worms in it. Moses said, Now eat it, this is the day, a Sabbath for God. You won't find any of it on the ground today. Gather it every day for six days, but the seventh day is Sabbath, there won't be any of it on the ground. On the seventh day, some of the people went out to gather anyway but they didn't find anything. God said to Moses, How long are you going to disobey my commands and not follow my instructions? Don't you see that God has given you the Sabbath? So on the sixth day he gives you bread for two days. So, each of you, stay home. Don't leave home on the seventh day. So the people quit working on the seventh day. The Israelites named it manna, what is it? It looked like coriander seed, whitish. And it tasted like a cracker with honey. Moses said, This is God's command, keep a two-quart jar of it, an omer, for future generations so they can see the bread that I fed you in the wilderness after I brought you out of Egypt. Moses told Aaron, Take a jar and fill it with two quarts of manna. Place it before God, keeping it safe for future generations. Aaron did what God commanded Moses. He set it aside before the testimony to preserve it. The Israelites ate the manna for forty years until they arrived at the land where they would settle down. They ate manna until they reached the border into Canaan. According to ancient measurements, an omer is one-tenth of an ephah. Directed by God, the whole company of Israel moved on by stages from the wilderness of sin. They set camp at Rephidim. And there wasn't a drop of water for the people to drink. The people took Moses to task, give us water to drink. But Moses said, Why pester me? Why are you testing God? But the people were thirsty for water there. They complained to Moses, Why did you take us from Egypt and drag us out here with our children and animals to die of thirst? Moses cried out in prayer to God, What can I do with these people? Any minute now they'll kill me. God said to Moses, Go on out ahead of the people, taking with you some of the elders of Israel. Take the staff you used to strike the Nile. And go. I'm going to be present before you there on the rock at Horeb. You are to strike the rock. Water will gush out of it and the people will drink. Moses did what he said, with the elders of Israel right there watching. He named the place Massa, testing place, and Meribah, quarreling, because of the quarreling of the Israelites and because of their testing of God when they said, Is God here with us, or not? Amalek came and fought Israel at Rephidim. Moses ordered Joshua, Select some men for us and go out and fight Amalek. Tomorrow I will take my stand on top of the hill holding God's staff. Joshua did what Moses ordered in order to fight Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and her went to the top of the hill. It turned out that whenever Moses raised his hands, Israel was winning, but whenever he lowered his hands, Amalek was winning. But Moses' hands got tired. So they got a stone and set it under him. 
He sat on it and Aaron and her held up his hands, one on each side. So his hands remained steady until the sun went down. Joshua defeated Amalek and its army in battle. God said to Moses, Write this up as a reminder to Joshua, to keep it before him, because I will most certainly wipe the very memory of Amalek off the face of the earth. Moses built an altar and named it, God my banner. He said, Salute God's rule. God at war with Amalek. Always and forever. Jethro, priest of Midian and father-in-law to Moses, heard the report of all that God had done for Moses and Israel his people, the news that God had delivered Israel from Egypt. Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, had taken in Zipporah, Moses' wife who had been sent back home, and her two sons. The name of the one was Gershom, Sojourner, for he had said, I'm a sojourner in a foreign land, the name of the other was Eliezer, God's help, because, the God of my father is my help and saved me from death by Pharaoh. Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, brought Moses his sons and his wife there in the wilderness where he was camped at the mountain of God. He had sent a message ahead to Moses, I, your father-in-law, am coming to you with your wife and two sons. Moses went out to welcome his father-in-law. He bowed to him and kissed him. Each asked the other how things had been with him. Then they went into the tent. Moses told his father-in-law the story of all that God had done to Pharaoh and Egypt in helping Israel, all the trouble they had experienced on the journey, and how God had delivered them. Jethro was delighted in all the good that God had done for Israel in delivering them from Egyptian oppression. Jethro said, Blessed be God who has delivered you from the power of Egypt and Pharaoh, who has delivered his people from the oppression of Egypt. Now I know that God is greater than all gods because he's done this to all those who treated Israel arrogantly. Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, brought a whole burnt offering in sacrifices to God. And Aaron, along with all the elders of Israel, came and ate the meal with Moses' father-in-law in the presence of God. The next day Moses took his place to judge the people. People were standing before him all day long, from morning to night. When Moses' father-in-law saw all that he was doing for the people, he said, What's going on here? Why are you doing all this, and all by yourself, letting everybody line up before you from morning to night? Moses said to his father-in-law, Because the people come to me with questions about God. When something comes up, they come to me. I judge between a man and his neighbor and teach them God's laws and instructions. Moses' father-in-law said, This is no way to go about it. You'll burn out, and the people ride along with you. This is way too much for you, you can't do this alone. Now listen to me. Let me tell you how to do this so that God will be in this with you. Be there for the people before God, but let the matters of concern be presented to God. Your job is to teach them the rules and instructions, to show them how to live, what to do. And then you need to keep a sharp eye out for competent men, men who fear God, men of integrity, men who are incorruptible, and appoint them as leaders over groups organized by the thousand, by the hundred, by fifty, and by ten. They'll be responsible for the everyday work of judging among the people. They'll bring the hard cases to you, but in the routine cases they'll be the judges. They will share your load and that will make it easier for you. If you handle the work this way, you'll have the strength to carry out whatever God commands you, and the people in their settings will flourish also. Moses listened to the counsel of his father-in-law and did everything he said. Moses picked competent men from all Israel and set them as leaders over the people who were organized by the thousand, 
by the hundred, by fifty, and by ten. They took over the everyday work of judging among the people. They brought the hard cases to Moses, but in the routine cases they were the judges. Then Moses said goodbye to his father-in-law who went home to his own country. Three months after leaving Egypt the Israelites entered the wilderness of Sinai. They followed the route from Rephidim, arrived at the wilderness of Sinai, and set up camp. Israel camped there facing the mountain. As Moses went up to meet God, God called down to him from the mountain, Speak to the house of Jacob, tell the people of Israel, You have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to me. If you will listen obediently to what I say and keep my covenant, out of all peoples you'll be my special treasure. The whole earth is mine to choose from, but you're special, a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. This is what I want you to tell the people of Israel. Moses came back and called the elders of Israel together and set before them all these words which God had commanded him. The people were unanimous in their response, everything God says, we will do. Moses took the people's answer back to God. God said to Moses, Get ready. I'm about to come to you in a thick cloud so that the people can listen in and trust you completely when I speak with you. Again Moses reported the people's answer to God. God said to Moses, Go to the people. For the next two days get these people ready to meet the holy God. Have them scrub their clothes so that on the third day they'll be fully prepared, because on the third day God will come down on Mount Sinai and make his presence known to all the people. Post boundaries for the people all around, telling them, warning. Don't climb the mountain. Don't even touch its edge. Whoever touches the mountain dies, a certain death. And no one is to touch that person, he's to be stoned. That's right, stoned or shot with arrows, shot to death. Animal or man, whichever, put to death. A long blast from the horn will signal that it's safe to climb the mountain. Moses went down the mountain to the people and prepared them for the holy meeting. They gave their clothes a good scrubbing. Then he addressed the people, Be ready in three days. Don't sleep with a woman. On the third day at daybreak, there were loud claps of thunder, flashes of lightning, a thick cloud covering the mountain, and an ear-piercing trumpet blast. Everyone in the camp shuddered in fear. Moses led the people out of the camp to meet God. They stood at attention at the base of the mountain. Mount Sinai was all smoke because God had come down on it as fire. Smoke poured from it like smoke from a furnace. The whole mountain shuddered and heaved. The trumpet blasts grew louder and louder. Moses spoke and God answered in thunder. God descended to the peak of Mount Sinai. God called Moses up to the peak and Moses climbed up. God said to Moses, Go down. Warn the people not to break through the barricades to get a look at God lest many of them die. And the priests also, warn them to prepare themselves for the holy meeting, lest God break out against them. Moses said to God, But the people can't climb Mount Sinai. You've already warned us well telling us, post boundaries around the mountain. Respect the holy mountain. God told him, Go down and then bring Aaron back up with you. But make sure that the priests and the people don't break through and come up to God, lest he break out against them. So Moses went down to the people. He said to them, God spoke all these words, I am God, your God. Who brought you out of the land of Egypt? Out of a life of slavery. No other gods, only me. 
No carved gods of any size, shape, or form of anything whatever, whether of things that fly or walk or swim. Don't bow down to them and don't serve them because I am God, your God, and I'm a most jealous God, punishing the children for any sins their parents pass on to them to the third, and yes, even to the fourth generation of those who hate me. But I'm unswervingly loyal to the thousands who love me and keep my commandments. No using the name of God, your God, in curses or silly banter, God won't put up with the irreverent use of his name. Observe the Sabbath day, to keep it holy. Work six days and do everything you need to do. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to God, your God. Don't do any work, not you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your servant, nor your maid, nor your animals, not even the foreign guest visiting in your town. For in six days God made heaven, earth, and sea, and everything in them, he rested on the seventh day. Therefore God blessed the Sabbath day, he set it apart as a holy day. Honor your father and mother so that you'll live a long time in the land that God, your God, is giving you. No murder. No adultery. No stealing. No lies about your neighbor. No lusting after your neighbor's house, or wife or servant or maid or ox or donkey. Don't set your heart on anything that is your neighbor's. All the people, experiencing the thunder and lightning, the trumpet blast and the smoking mountain, were afraid, they pulled back and stood at a distance. They said to Moses, You speak to us and we'll listen, but don't have God speak to us or we'll die. Moses spoke to the people, Don't be afraid. God has come to test you and instill a deep and reverent awe within you so that you won't sin. The people kept their distance while Moses approached the thick cloud where God was. God said to Moses, Give this message to the people of Israel, You've experienced firsthand how I spoke with you from heaven. Don't make gods of silver and gods of gold and then set them alongside me. Make me an earthen altar. Sacrifice your whole burnt offerings, your peace offerings, your sheep, and your cattle on it. Every place where I cause my name to be honored in your worship, I'll be there myself and bless you. If you use stones to make my altar, don't use dressed stones. If you use a chisel on the stones you'll profane the altar. Don't use steps to climb to my altar because that will expose your nakedness. These are the laws that you are to place before them. When you buy a Hebrew slave, he will serve six years. The seventh year he goes free, for nothing. If he came in single he leaves single. If he came in married he leaves with his wife. If the master gives him a wife and she gave him sons and daughters, the wife and children stay with the master and he leaves by himself. But suppose the slave should say, I love my master and my wife and children, I don't want my freedom, then his master is to bring him before God and to a door or doorpost and pierce his ear with an awl, a sign that he is a slave for life. When a man sells his daughter to be a handmaid, she doesn't go free after six years like the men. If she doesn't please her master, her family must buy her back, her master doesn't have the right to sell her to foreigners since he broke his word to her. If he turns her over to his son, he has to treat her like a daughter. If he marries another woman, she retains all her full rights to meals, clothing, and marital relations. If he won't do any of these three things for her, she goes free, for nothing. If someone hits another and death results, the penalty is death. But if there was no intent to kill, if it was an accident, an act of God, I'll set aside a place to which the killer can flee for refuge. But if the murder was premeditated, cunningly plotted, 
then drag the killer away, even if it's from my altar, to be put to death. If someone hits father or mother, the penalty is death. If someone kidnaps a person, the penalty is death, regardless of whether the person has been sold or is still held in possession. If someone curses father or mother, the penalty is death. If a quarrel breaks out and one hits the other with a rock or a fist and the injured one doesn't die but is confined to bed and then later gets better and can get about on a crutch, the one who hit him is in the clear, except to pay for the loss of time and make sure of complete recovery. If a slave owner hits a slave, male or female, with a stick and the slave dies on the spot, the slave must be avenged. But if the slave survives a day or two, he's not to be avenged, the slave is the owner's property. When there's a fight and in the fight a pregnant woman is hit so that she miscarries but is not otherwise hurt, the one responsible has to pay whatever the husband demands in compensation. But if there is further damage, then you must give life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, bruise for bruise. If a slave owner hits the eye of a slave or handmaid and ruins it, the owner must let the slave go free because of the eye. If the owner knocks out the tooth of the male or female slave, the slave must be released and go free because of the tooth. If an ox scores a man or a woman to death, the ox must be stoned. The meat cannot be eaten but the owner of the ox is in the clear. But if the ox has a history of goring and the owner knew it and did nothing to guard against it, then if the ox kills a man or a woman, the ox is to be stoned and the owner given the death penalty. If a ransom is agreed upon instead of death, he must pay it in full as a redemption for his life. If a son or daughter is gored, the same judgment holds. If it is a slave or a handmaid the ox scores, thirty shekels of silver is to be paid to the owner and the ox stoned. If someone uncovers a cistern or digs a pit and leaves it open and an ox or donkey falls into it, the owner of the pit must pay whatever the animal is worth to its owner but can keep the dead animal. If someone's ox injures a neighbor's ox and the ox dies, they must sell the live ox and split the price, they must also split the dead animal. But if the ox had a history of goring and the owner knew it and did nothing to guard against it, the owner must pay an ox for an ox but can keep the dead animal. If someone steals an ox or a lamb and slaughters or sells it, the thief must pay five cattle in place of the ox and four sheep in place of the lamb. If the thief is caught while breaking in and is hit hard and dies, there is no blood guilt. But if it happens after daybreak, there is blood guilt. A thief must make full restitution for what is stolen. The thief who is unable to pay is to be sold for his thieving. If caught red-handed with the stolen goods, and the ox or donkey or lamb is still alive, the thief pays double. If someone grazes livestock in a field or vineyard but lets them loose so they graze in someone else's field, restitution must be made from the best of the owner's field or vineyard. If fire breaks out and spreads to the brush so that the sheaves of grain or the standing grain or even the whole field is burned up, whoever started the fire must pay for the damages. If someone gives a neighbor money or things for safekeeping and they are stolen from the neighbor's house, the thief, if caught, must pay back double. If the thief is not caught, the owner must be brought before God to determine whether the owner was the one who took the neighbor's goods. In all cases of stolen goods, whether oxen, donkeys, sheep, clothing, anything in fact missing of which someone says, that's mine, both parties must come before the judges. The one the judges pronounce guilty must pay double to the other. 
If someone gives a donkey or ox or lamb or any kind of animal to another for safekeeping and it dies or is injured or lost and there is no witness, an oath before God must be made between them to decide whether one has laid hands on the property of the other. The owner must accept this and no damages are assessed. But if it turns out it was stolen, the owner must be compensated. If it has been torn by wild beasts, the torn animal must be brought in as evidence, no damages have to be paid. If someone borrows an animal from a neighbor and it gets injured or dies while the owner is not present, he must pay for it. But if the owner was with it, he doesn't have to pay. If the animal was hired, the payment covers the loss. If a man seduces a virgin who is not engaged to be married and sleeps with her, he must pay the marriage price and marry her. If her father absolutely refuses to give her away, the man must still pay the marriage price for virgins. Don't let a sorceress live. Anyone who has sex with an animal gets the death penalty. Anyone who sacrifices to a god other than God alone must be put to death. Don't abuse or take advantage of strangers, you, remember, were once strangers in Egypt. Don't mistreat widows or orphans. If you do and they cry out to me, you can be sure I'll take them most seriously, I'll show my anger and come raging among you with the sword, and your wives will end up widows and your children orphans. If you lend money to my people, to any of the down and out among you, don't come down hard on them and gouge them with interest. If you take your neighbor's coat as security, give it back before nightfall, it may be your neighbor's only covering, what else does the person have to sleep in? And if I hear the neighbor crying out from the cold, I'll step in, I'm compassionate. Don't curse God, and don't damn your leaders. Don't be stingy as your wine vats fill up. Dedicate your firstborn sons to me. The same with your cattle and sheep, they are to stay for seven days with their mother, then give them to me. Be holy for my sake. Don't eat mutilated flesh you find in the fields, throw it to the dogs. Don't pass on malicious gossip. Don't link up with a wicked person and give corrupt testimony. Don't go along with the crowd in doing evil and don't mess up your testimony in a case just to please the crowd. And just because someone is poor, don't show favoritism in a dispute. If you find your enemy's ox or donkey loose, take it back to him. If you see the donkey of someone who hates you lying helpless under its load, don't walk off and leave it. Help it up. When there is a dispute concerning your poor, don't tamper with the justice due them. Stay clear of false accusations. Don't contribute to the death of innocent and good people. I don't let the wicked off the hook. Don't take bribes. Bribes blind perfectly good eyes and twist the speech of good people. Don't take advantage of a stranger. You know what it's like to be a stranger, you were strangers in Egypt. So your land for six years and gather in its crops, but in the seventh year leave it alone and give it a rest so that your poor may eat from it. What they leave, let the wildlife have. Do the same with your vineyards and olive groves. Work for six days and rest the seventh so your ox and donkey may rest and your servant and migrant workers may have time to get their needed rest. Listen carefully to everything I tell you. Don't pay attention to other gods, don't so much as mention their names. Three times a year you are to hold a festival for me. Hold the spring festival of unraised bread when you eat unraised bread for seven days at the time set for the month of Abib, as I commanded you. That was the month you came out of Egypt. No one should show up before me empty-handed. Hold the summer festival of harvest when you bring in the first fruits of all your work in the fields. 
Hold the autumn festival of ingathering at the end of the season when you bring in the year's crops. Three times a year all your males are to appear before the Master, God. Don't offer the blood of a sacrifice to me with anything that has yeast in it. Don't leave the fat from my festival offering out overnight. Bring the choice first produce of the year to the house of your God. Don't boil a kid in its mother's milk. Now get yourselves ready. I'm sending my angel ahead of you to guard you in your travels, to lead you to the place that I've prepared. Pay close attention to him. Obey him. Don't go against him. He won't put up with your rebellions because he's acting on my authority. But if you obey him and do everything I tell you, I'll be an enemy to your enemies, I'll fight those who fight you. When my angel goes ahead of you and leads you to the land of the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, I'll clear the country of them. So don't worship or serve their gods, don't do anything they do because I'm going to wipe them right off the face of the earth and smash their sacred phallic pillars to bits. But you, you serve your God and he'll bless your food and your water. I'll get rid of the sickness among you, there won't be any miscarriages nor barren women in your land. I'll make sure you live full and complete lives. I'll send my terror on ahead of you and throw those peoples you're approaching into a panic. All you'll see of your enemies is the backs of their necks. And I'll send despair on ahead of you. It will push the Hivites, the Canaanites, and the Hittites out of your way. I won't get rid of them all at once lest the land grow up in weeds and the wild animals take over. Little by little I'll get them out of there while you have a chance to get your crops going and make the land your own. I will make your borders stretch from the Red Sea to the Mediterranean Sea and from the wilderness to the Euphrates River. I'm turning everyone living in that land over to you, go ahead and drive them out. Don't make any deals with them or their gods. They are not to stay in the same country with you lest they get you to sin by worshipping their gods. Beware. That's a huge danger. He said to Moses, Climb the mountain to God, you and Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel. They will worship from a distance, only Moses will approach God. The rest are not to come close. And the people are not to climb the mountain at all. So Moses went to the people and told them everything God had said, all the rules and regulations. They all answered in unison, everything God said, will do. Then Moses wrote it all down, everything God had said. He got up early the next morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain using twelve pillar stones for the twelve tribes of Israel. Then he directed young Israelite men to offer whole burnt offerings and sacrifice peace offerings of bulls. Moses took half the blood and put it in bowls, the other half he threw against the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it as the people listened. They said, everything God said, we'll do. Yes, we'll obey. Moses took the rest of the blood and threw it out over the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant which God has made with you out of all these words I have spoken. Then they climbed the mountain, Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel, and saw the God of Israel. He was standing on a pavement of something like sapphires, pure, clear sky blue. He didn't hurt these pillar leaders of the Israelites, they saw God, and they ate and drank. God said to Moses, Climb higher up the mountain and wait there for me, I'll give you tablets of stone, the teachings and commandments that I've written to instruct them. So Moses got up, accompanied by Joshua his aide. And Moses climbed up the mountain of God. He told the elders of Israel, 
wait for us here until we return to you. You have Aaron and her with you, if there are any problems, go to them. Then Moses climbed the mountain. The cloud covered the mountain. The glory of God settled over Mount Sinai. The cloud covered it for six days. On the seventh day he called out of the cloud to Moses. In the view of the Israelites below, the glory of God looked like a raging fire at the top of the mountain. Moses entered the middle of the cloud and climbed the mountain. Moses was on the mountain forty days and forty nights. God spoke to Moses, Tell the Israelites that they are to set aside offerings for me. Receive the offerings from everyone who is willing to give. These are the offerings I want you to receive from them, gold, silver, bronze, blue, purple, and scarlet material, fine linen, goat's hair, tanned ram skins, dolphin skins, acacia wood, lamp oil, spices for anointing oils and for fragrant incense, onyx stones and other stones for setting in the ephod and the breastpiece. Let them construct a sanctuary for me so that I can live among them. You are to construct it following the plans I've given you, the design for the dwelling and the design for all its furnishings. First let them make a chest using acacia wood, make it three and three quarters feet long and two and one quarter feet wide and deep. Cover it with a veneer of pure gold inside and out and make a molding of gold all around it. Cast four gold rings and attach them to its four feet, two rings on one side and two rings on the other. Make poles from acacia wood and cover them with a veneer of gold and insert them into the rings on the sides of the chest for carrying the chest. The poles are to stay in the rings, they must not be removed. Place the testimony that I give you in the chest. Now make a lid of pure gold for the chest, an atonement cover, three and three quarters feet long and two and one quarter feet wide. Sculpt two winged angels out of hammered gold for either end of the atonement cover, one angel at one end, one angel at the other. Make them of one piece with the atonement cover. Make the angels with their wings spread, hovering over the atonement cover, facing one another but looking down on it. Set the atonement cover as a lid over the chest and place in the chest the testimony that I will give you. I will meet you there at set times and speak with you from above the atonement cover and from between the angel figures that are on it, speaking the commands that I have for the Israelites. Next make a table from acacia wood. Make it three feet long, one and one half feet wide and two and one quarter feet high. Cover it with a veneer of pure gold. Make a molding all around it of gold. Make the border a handbreadth wide all around it and a rim of gold for the border. Make four rings of gold and attach the rings to the four legs parallel to the tabletop. They will serve as holders for the poles used to carry the table. Make the poles of acacia wood and cover them with a veneer of gold. They will be used to carry the table. Make plates, bowls, jars, and jugs for pouring out offerings. Make them of pure gold. Always keep fresh bread of the presence on the table before me. Make a lampstand of pure hammered gold. Make its stem and branches, cups, calyxes, and petals all of one piece. Give it six branches, three from one side and three from the other, Put three cups shaped like almond blossoms, each with calyx and petals, on one branch, three on the next, and so on, the same for all six branches. On the main stem of the lampstand, make four cups shaped like almonds, with calyx and petals, a calyx extending from under each pair of the six branches, the entire lampstand fashioned from one piece of hammered pure gold. Make seven of these lamps for the table. Arrange the lamps so they throw their light out in front. 
Make the candle snuffers and trays out of pure gold. Use a 75 pound brick of pure gold to make the lampstand and its accessories. Study the design you were given on the mountain and make everything accordingly. Make the dwelling itself from 10 panels of tapestry woven from fine twisted linen, blue and purple and scarlet material, with an angel cherubim design. A skilled craftsman should do it. The panels of tapestry are each to be 46 feet long and 6 feet wide. Join five of the panels together, and then the other five together. Make loops of blue along the edge of the outside panel of the first set and the same on the outside panel of the second set. Make 50 loops on each panel. Then make 50 gold clasps and join the tapestries together so that the dwelling is one whole. Next make tapestries of goat hair for a tent that will cover the dwelling. Make 11 panels of these tapestries. The length of each panel will be 45 feet long and 6 feet wide. Join 5 of the panels together, and then the other 6. Fold the sixth panel double at the front of the tent. Now make 50 loops along the edge of the end panel and 50 loops along the edge of the joining panel. Make 50 clasps of bronze and connect the clasps with the loops, bringing the tent together. Hang half of the overlap of the tapestry panels over the rear of the dwelling. The 18 inches of overlap on either side will cover the sides of the tent. Finally, make a covering for the tapestries of tanned ram skins dyed red and over that a covering of dolphin skins. Frame the dwelling with planks of acacia wood, each section of frame 15 feet long and 2 and 1 quarter feet wide, with two pegs for securing them. Make all the frames identical, 20 frames for the south side with 40 silver sockets to receive the two pegs from each of the 20 frames, the same construction on the north side of the dwelling, for the rear of the dwelling, which faces west, make six frames with two additional frames for the rear corners. Both of the two corner frames need to be double in thickness from top to bottom and fit into a single ring, eight frames altogether with sixteen sockets of silver, two under each frame. Now make crossbars of acacia wood, five for the frames on one side of the dwelling, five for the other side, and five for the back side facing west. The center crossbar runs from end to end halfway up the frames. Cover the frames with a veneer of gold and make gold rings to hold the crossbars. And cover the crossbars with a veneer of gold. Then put the dwelling together, following the design you were shown on the mountain. Make a curtain of blue, purple, and scarlet material and fine twisted linen. Have a design of angel cherubim woven into it by a skilled craftsman. Fasten it with gold hooks to four posts of acacia wood covered with a veneer of gold, set on four silver bases. After hanging the curtain from the clasps, bring the chest of the testimony in behind the curtain. The curtain will separate the holy place from the holy of holies. Now place the atonement cover lid on the chest of the testimony in the holy of holies. Place the table and the lampstand outside the curtain, the lampstand on the south side of the dwelling and the table opposite it on the north side. Make a screen for the door of the tent. Weave it from blue, purple, and scarlet material and fine twisted linen. Frame the weaving with five poles of acacia wood covered with a veneer of gold and make gold hooks to hang the weaving. Cast five bronze bases for the poles. Make an altar of acacia wood. Make it seven and a half feet square and four and a half feet high. Make horns at each of the four corners. The horns are to be of one piece with the altar and covered with a veneer of bronze. Make buckets for removing the ashes, along with shovels, basins, forks, and fire pans. 
Make all these utensils from bronze. Make a grate of bronze mesh and attach bronze rings at each of the four corners. Put the grate under the ledge of the altar at the halfway point of the altar. Make acacia wood poles for the altar and cover them with a veneer of bronze. Insert the poles through the rings on the two sides of the altar for carrying. Use boards to make the altar, keeping the interior hollow. Make a courtyard for the dwelling. The south side is to be 150 feet long. The hangings for the courtyard are to be woven from fine twisted linen, with their 20 posts, 20 bronze bases, and fastening hooks and bands of silver. The north side is to be exactly the same. For the west end of the courtyard you will need 75 feet of hangings with their 10 posts and bases. Across the 75 feet at the front, or east end, you will need 22 and a half feet of hangings, with their three posts and bases on one side and the same for the other side. At the door of the courtyard make a screen 30 feet long woven from blue, purple, and scarlet stuff, with fine twisted linen, embroidered by a craftsman, and hung on its four posts and bases. All the posts around the courtyard are to be banded with silver, with hooks of silver and bases of bronze. The courtyard is to be 150 feet long and 75 feet wide. The hangings of fine twisted linen set on their bronze bases are to be seven and a half feet high. All the tools used for setting up the holy dwelling, including all the pegs in it and the courtyard, are to be made of bronze. Now, order the Israelites to bring you pure, clear olive oil for light so that the lamps can be kept burning. In the tent of meeting, the area outside the curtain that veils the testimony, Aaron and his sons will keep this light burning from evening until morning before God. This is to be a permanent practice down through the generations for Israelites. Get your brother Aaron and his sons from among the Israelites to serve me as priests, Aaron and his sons Nadab, Abihu, Eliezer, Ithamar. Make sacred vestments for your brother Aaron to symbolize glory and beauty. Consult with the skilled craftsmen, those whom I have gifted in this work, and arrange for them to make Aaron's vestments, to set him apart as holy, to act as priest for me. These are the articles of clothing they are to make, breastpiece, ephod, robe, woven tunic, turban, sash. They are making holy vestments for your brother Aaron and his sons as they work as priests for me. They will need gold, blue, purple, and scarlet material, and fine linen. Have the ephod made from gold, blue, purple, and scarlet material and fine twisted linen by a skilled craftsman. Give it two shoulder pieces at two of the corners so it can be fastened. The decorated band on it is to be just like it and of one piece with it, made of gold, blue, purple, and scarlet material, and of fine twisted linen. Next take two onyx stones and engrave the names of the sons of Israel on them in the order of their birth, six names on one stone and the remaining six on the other. Engrave the names of the sons of Israel on the two stones the way a jeweler engraves a seal. Then mount the stones in settings of filigreed gold. Fasten the two stones on the shoulder pieces of the ephod, they are memorial stones for the Israelites. Aaron will wear these names on his shoulders as a memorial before God. Make the settings of gold filigree. Make two chains of pure gold and braid them like cords, then attach the corded chains to the settings. Now make a breastpiece of judgment, using skilled craftsmen, the same as with the ephod. Use gold, blue, purple, and scarlet material, and fine twisted linen. Make it nine inches square and fold it double. Mount four rows of precious gemstones on it. First row, carnelian, topaz, 
emerald. Second row, ruby, sapphire, crystal. Third row, jacinth, agate, amethyst. Fourth row, beryl, onyx, jasper. Set them in gold filigree. The twelve stones correspond to the names of the Israelites, with twelve names engraved, one on each, as on a seal for the twelve tribes. Then make braided chains of pure gold for the breastpiece, like cords. Make two rings of gold for the breastpiece and fasten them to the two ends. Fasten the two golden cords to the rings at the ends of the breastpiece. Then fasten the other ends of the two cords to the two settings of filigree, attaching them to the shoulder pieces of the ephod in front. Then make two rings of gold and fasten them to the two ends of the breastpiece on its inside edge facing the ephod. Then make two more rings of gold and fasten them in the front of the ephod to the lower part of the two shoulder pieces, near the seam above the decorated band. Fasten the breast piece in place by running a cord of blue through its rings to the rings of the ephod so that it rests secure on the decorated band of the ephod and won't come loose. Aaron will regularly carry the names of the sons of Israel on the breastpiece of judgment over his heart as he enters the sanctuary into the presence of God for remembrance. Place the Urim and Thummim in the breastpiece of judgment. They will be over Aaron's heart when he enters the presence of God. In this way Aaron will regularly carry the breastpiece of judgment into the presence of God. Make the robe for the ephod entirely of blue, with an opening for the head at the center and the hem on the edge so that it won't tear. For the edge of the skirts make pomegranates of blue, purple, and scarlet material all around and alternate them with bells of gold, gold bell and pomegranate, gold bell and pomegranate, all around the hem of the robe. Aaron has to wear it when he does his priestly work. The bells will be heard when he enters the holy place and comes into the presence of God, and again when he comes out so that he won't die. Make a plate of pure gold. Engrave on it as on a seal, holy to God. Tie it with a blue cord to the front of the turban. It is to rest there on Aaron's forehead. He'll take on any guilt involved in the sacred offerings that the Israelites dedicate, no matter what they bring. It will always be on Aaron's forehead so that the offerings will be acceptable before God. Weave the tunic of fine linen. Make the turban of fine linen. The sash will be the work of an embroiderer. Make tunics, sashes, and hats for Aaron's sons to express glory and beauty. Dress your brother Aaron and his sons in them. Anoint, ordain, and dedicate them to serve me as priests. Make linen underwear to cover their nakedness from waist to thigh. Aaron and his sons must wear it whenever they enter the tent of meeting or approach the altar to minister in the holy place so that they won't incur guilt and die. This is a permanent rule for Aaron and all his priest descendants. This is the ceremony for dedicating them as priests. Take a young bull and two rams, healthy and without defects. Using fine wheat flour but no yeast make bread and cakes mixed with oil and wafers spread with oil. Place them in a basket and carry them along with the bull and the two rams. Bring Aaron and his sons to the entrance of the tent of meeting and wash them with water. Then take the vestments and dress Aaron in the tunic, the robe of the ephod, the ephod, and the breast piece, belting the ephod on him with the embroidered waistband. Set the turban on his head and place the sacred crown on the turban. Then take the anointing oil and pour it on his head, anointing him. Then bring his sons, put tunics on them and gird them with sashes, both Aaron and his sons, and set hats on them. Their priesthood is upheld by law and is permanent. This is how you will ordain Aaron and his sons, bring the bull to the tent of meeting. 
Aaron and his sons will place their hands on the head of the bull. Then you will slaughter the bull in the presence of God at the entrance to the tent of meeting. Take some of the bull's blood and smear it on the horns of the altar with your finger, pour the rest of the blood on the base of the altar. Next take all the fat that covers the innards, fat from around the liver and the two kidneys, and burn it on the altar. But the flesh of the bull, including its hide and dung, you will burn up outside the camp. It is an absolution offering. Then take one of the rams. Have Aaron and his sons place their hands on the head of the ram. Slaughter the ram and take its blood and throw it against the altar, all around. Cut the ram into pieces, wash its innards and legs, then gather the pieces and its head and burn the whole ram on the altar. It is a whole burnt offering to God, a pleasant fragrance, an offering by fire to God. Then take the second ram. Have Aaron and his sons place their hands on the ram's head. Slaughter the ram. Take some of its blood and rub it on Aaron's right earlobe and on the right earlobes of his sons, on the thumbs of their right hands and on the big toes of their right feet. Sprinkle the rest of the blood against all sides of the altar. Then take some of the blood that is on the altar, mix it with some of the anointing oil, and splash it on Aaron in his clothes and on his sons and their clothes so that Aaron in his clothes and his sons and his sons' clothes will be made holy. Take the fat from the ram, the fat tail, the fat that covers the innards, the long lobe of the liver, the two kidneys and the fat on them, and the right thigh, this is the ordination ram. Also take one loaf of bread, an oil cake, and a wafer from the bread basket that is in the presence of God. Place all of these in the open hands of Aaron and his sons who will wave them before God, a wave offering. Then take them from their hands and burn them on the altar with the whole burnt offering, a pleasing fragrance before God, a gift to God. Now take the breast from Aaron's ordination ram and wave it before God, a wave offering. That will be your portion. Bless the wave offering breast and the thigh that was held up. These are the parts of the ordination ram that are for Aaron and his sons. Aaron and his sons are always to get this offering from the Israelites. The Israelites are to make this offering regularly from their peace offerings. Aaron's sacred garments are to be handed down to his descendants so they can be anointed and ordained in them. The son who succeeds him as priest is to wear them for seven days and enter the tent of meeting to minister in the holy place. Take the ordination ram and boil the meat in the holy place. At the entrance to the tent of meeting, Aaron and his sons will eat the boiled ram and the bread that is in the basket. Atoned by these offerings, ordained and hallowed by them, they are the only ones who are to eat them. No outsiders are to eat them, they're holy. Anything from the ordination ram or from the bread that is left over until morning you are to burn up. Don't eat it, it's holy. Do everything for the ordination of Aaron and his sons exactly as I've commanded you throughout the seven days. Offer a bull as an absolution offering for atonement each day. Offer it on the altar when you make atonement for it, anoint and hallow it. Make atonement for the altar and hallow it for seven days, the altar will become soaked in holiness, anyone who so much as touches the altar will become holy. This is what you are to offer on the altar, two-year-old lambs each and every day, one lamb in the morning and the second lamb at evening. With the sacrifice of the first lamb offer two quarts of fine flour with a quart of virgin olive oil, plus a quart of wine for a drink offering. The sacrifice of the second lamb, the one at evening, is also to be accompanied by the same grain offering and drink offering of the morning sacrifice to give a pleasing fragrance, a gift to God. This is to be your regular, daily whole burnt offering before God, 
generation after generation, sacrificed at the entrance of the tent of meeting. That's where I'll meet you, that's where I'll speak with you, that's where I'll meet the Israelites, at the place made holy by my glory. I'll make the tent of meeting and the altar holy. I'll make Aaron and his sons holy in order to serve me as priests. I'll move in and live with the Israelites. I'll be their God. They'll realize that I am their God who brought them out of the land of Egypt so that I could live with them. I am God, your God. Make an altar for burning incense. Construct it from acacia wood, one and one half feet square and three feet high with its horns of one piece with it. Cover it with a veneer of pure gold, its top, sides, and horns, and make a gold molding around it with two rings of gold beneath the molding. Place the rings on the two opposing sides to serve as holders for poles by which it will be carried. Make the poles of acacia wood and cover them with a veneer of gold. Place the altar in front of the curtain that hides the chest of the testimony, in front of the atonement cover that is over the testimony where I will meet you. Aaron will burn fragrant incense on it every morning when he polishes the lamps, and again in the evening as he prepares the lamps for lighting, so that there will always be incense burning before God, generation after generation. But don't burn on this altar any unholy incense or whole burnt offering or grain offering. And don't pour out drink offerings on it. Once a year Aaron is to purify the altar horns. Using the blood of the absolution offering of atonement, he is to make this atonement every year down through the generations. It is most holy to God. God spoke to Moses, when you take a head count of the Israelites to keep track of them, all must pay an atonement tax to God for their life at the time of being registered so that nothing bad will happen because of the registration. Everyone who gets counted is to give a half shekel, using the standard sanctuary shekel of a fifth of an ounce to the shekel, a half shekel offering to God. Everyone counted, age 20 and up, is to make the offering to God. The rich are not to pay more nor the poor less than the half-shekel offering to God, the atonement tax for your lives. Take the atonement tax money from the Israelites and put it to the maintenance of the tent of meeting. It will be a memorial fund for the Israelites in honor of God, making atonement for your lives. God spoke to Moses, Make a bronze wash basin, make it with a bronze base. Place it between the tent of meeting and the altar. Put water in it. Aaron and his sons will wash their hands and feet in it. When they enter the tent of meeting or approach the altar to serve there or offer gift offerings to God, they are to wash so they will not die. They are to wash their hands and their feet so they will not die. This is the rule forever for Aaron and his sons down through the generations. God spoke to Moses, Take the best spices, twelve and a half pounds of liquid myrrh, half that much, six and a quarter pounds, of fragrant cinnamon, six and a quarter pounds of fragrant cane, twelve and a half pounds of cassia, using the standard sanctuary weight for all of them, and a gallon of olive oil. Make these into a holy anointing oil, a perfumer's skillful blend. Use it to anoint the tent of meeting, the chest of the testimony, the table and all its utensils, the lampstand and its utensils, the altar of incense, the altar of whole burnt offerings and all its utensils, and the wash basin and its base. Dedicate them so they'll be soaked in holiness, so that anyone who so much as touches them will become holy. Then anoint Aaron and his sons. Consecrate them as priests to me. Tell the Israelites, this will be my holy anointing oil throughout your generations. Don't pour it on ordinary men. Don't copy this mixture to use for yourselves. It's holy, keep it holy. 
Whoever mixes up anything like it, or puts it on an ordinary person, will be exiled. God spoke to Moses, take fragrant spices, gum resin, onica, galbanum, and add pure frankincense. Mix the spices in equal proportions to make an aromatic incense, the art of a perfumer, salted and pure, holy. Now crush some of it into powder and place some of it before the testimony in the tent of meeting where I will meet with you, it will be for you the holiest of holy places. When you make this incense, you are not to copy the mixture for your own use. It's holy to God, keep it that way. Whoever copies it for personal use will be excommunicated. God spoke to Moses, See what I've done, I've personally chosen Bezalel son of Uri, son of her of the tribe of Judah. I've filled him with the Spirit of God, giving him skill and know-how and expertise in every kind of craft to create designs and work in gold, silver, and bronze, to cut and set gemstones, to carve wood, he's an all-around craftsman. Not only that, but I've given him Oholiab, son of Ahizamach of the tribe of Dan, to work with him. And to all who have an aptitude for crafts I've given the skills to make all the things I've commanded you, the tent of meeting, the chest of the testimony and its atonement cover, all the implements for the tent, the table and its implements, the pure lampstand and all its implements, the altar of incense, the altar of whole burnt offering and all its implements, the wash basin and its base, the official vestments, the holy vestments for Aaron the priest and his sons in their priestly duties, the anointing oil, and the aromatic incense for the holy place, they'll make everything just the way I've commanded you. God spoke to Moses, Tell the Israelites, above all, keep my Sabbaths, the sign between me and you, generation after generation, to keep the knowledge alive that I am the God who makes you holy. Keep the Sabbath, it's holy to you. Whoever profanes it will most certainly be put to death. Whoever works on it will be excommunicated from the people. There are six days for work but the seventh day is Sabbath, pure rest, holy to God. Anyone who works on the Sabbath will most certainly be put to death. The Israelites will keep the Sabbath, observe Sabbath keeping down through the generations, as a standing covenant. It's a fixed sign between me and the Israelites. Yes, because in six days God made the heavens and the earth and on the seventh day he stopped and took a long, deep breath. When he finished speaking with him on Mount Sinai, he gave Moses two tablets of testimony, slabs of stone, written with the finger of God. When the people realized that Moses was taking forever in coming down off the mountain, they rallied around Aaron and said, Do something. Make gods for us who will lead us. That Moses, the man who got us out of Egypt, who knows what's happened to him. So Aaron told them, Take off the gold rings from the ears of your wives and sons and daughters and bring them to me. They all did it, they removed the gold rings from their ears and brought them to Aaron. He took the gold from their hands and cast it in the form of a calf, shaping it with an engraving tool. The people responded with enthusiasm, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up from Egypt. Aaron, taking in the situation, built an altar before the calf. Aaron then announced, Tomorrow is a feast day to God. Early the next morning, the people got up and offered whole burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. The people sat down to eat and drink and then began to party. It turned into a wild party. God spoke to Moses, Go. Get down there. Your people whom you brought up from the land of Egypt have fallen to pieces. In no time at all they've turned away from the way I commanded them, they made a molten calf and worshipped it. They've sacrificed to it and said, these are the gods, O Israel, 
that brought you up from the land of Egypt. God said to Moses, I look at this people, oh! What a stubborn, hard-headed people! Let me alone now, give my anger free reign to burst into flames and incinerate them. But I'll make a great nation out of you. Moses tried to calm his God down. He said, Why, God, would you lose your temper with your people? Why, you brought them out of Egypt in a tremendous demonstration of power and strength. Why let the Egyptians say, he had it in for them, he brought them out so he could kill them in the mountains, wipe them right off the face of the earth. Stop your anger. Think twice about bringing evil against your people. Think of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants to whom you gave your word, telling them, I will give you many children, as many as the stars in the sky, and I'll give this land to your children as their land forever. And God did think twice. He decided not to do the evil he had threatened against his people. Moses turned around and came down from the mountain, carrying the two tablets of the testimony. The tablets were written on both sides, front and back. God made the tablets and God wrote the tablets, engraved them. When Joshua heard the sound of the people shouting noisily, he said to Moses, that's the sound of war in the camp. But Moses said, those aren't songs of victory. And those aren't songs of defeat. I hear songs of people throwing a party. And that's what it was. When Moses came near to the camp and saw the calf and the people dancing, his anger flared. He threw down the tablets and smashed them to pieces at the foot of the mountain. He took the calf that they had made, melted it down with fire, pulverized it to powder, then scattered it on the water and made the Israelites drink it. Moses said to Aaron, what on earth did these people ever do to you that you involved them in this huge sin? Aaron said, Master, don't be angry. You know this people and how set on evil they are. They said to me, Make us gods who will lead us. This Moses, the man who brought us out of Egypt, we don't know what's happened to him. So I said, Who has gold? And they took off their jewelry and gave it to me. I threw it in the fire and out came this calf. Moses saw that the people were simply running wild, Aaron had let them run wild, disgracing themselves before their enemies. He took up a position at the entrance to the camp and said, Whoever is on God's side, join me. All the Levites stepped up. He then told them, God's orders, the God of Israel, strap on your swords and go to work. Crisscross the camp from one end to the other, kill brother, friend, neighbor. The Levites carried out Moses' orders. Three thousand of the people were killed that day. Moses said, You confirmed your ordination today, and at great cost, even killing your sons and brothers. And God has blessed you. The next day Moses addressed the people, You have sinned an enormous sin. But I am going to go up to God, maybe I'll be able to clear you of your sin. Moses went back to God and said, This is terrible. This people has sinned, it's an enormous sin. They made gods of gold for themselves. And now, if you will only forgive their sin. But if not, erase me out of the book you've written. God said to Moses, I'll only erase from my book those who sin against me. For right now, you go and lead the people to where I told you. Look, my angel is going ahead of you. On the day, though, when I settle accounts, their sins will certainly be part of the settlement. God sent a plague on the people because of the calf they and Aaron had made. God said to Moses, Now go. 
Get on your way from here, you and the people you brought up from the land of Egypt. Head for the land which I promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I will send an angel ahead of you and I'll drive out the Canaanites, Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. It's a land flowing with milk and honey. But I won't be with you in person, you're such a stubborn, hard-headed people, lest I destroy you on the journey. When the people heard this harsh verdict, they were plunged into gloom and wore long faces. No one put on jewelry. God said to Moses, Tell the Israelites, you're one hard-headed people. I couldn't stand being with you for even a moment, I'd destroy you. So take off all your jewelry until I figure out what to do with you. So the Israelites stripped themselves of their jewelry from Mount Horabon. Moses used to take the tent and set it up outside the camp, some distance away. He called it the Tent of Meeting. Anyone who sought God would go to the Tent of Meeting outside the camp. It went like this, when Moses would go to the tent, all the people would stand at attention, each man would take his position at the entrance to his tent with his eyes on Moses until he entered the tent, whenever Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud descended to the entrance to the tent and God spoke with Moses. All the people would see the pillar of cloud at the entrance to the tent, stand at attention, and then bow down in worship, each man at the entrance to his tent. And God spoke with Moses face to face, as neighbors speak to one another. When he would return to the camp, his attendant, the young man Joshua, stayed, he didn't leave the tent. Moses said to God, Look, you tell me, lead this people, but you don't let me know whom you're going to send with me. You tell me, I know you well and you are special to me. If I am so special to you, let me in on your plans. That way, I will continue being special to you. Don't forget, this is your people, your responsibility. God said, my presence will go with you. I'll see the journey to the end. Moses said, if your presence doesn't take the lead here, call this trip off right now. How else will it be known that you're with me in this, with me and your people? Are you traveling with us or not? How else will we know that we're special, I and your people, among all other people on this planet Earth? God said to Moses, All right. Just as you say, this also I will do, for I know you well and you are special to me. I know you by name. Moses said, Please. Let me see your glory. God said, I will make my goodness pass right in front of you, I'll call out the name, God, right before you. I'll treat well whomever I want to treat well and I'll be kind to whomever I want to be kind. God continued, but you may not see my face. No one can see me and live. God said, look, here is a place right beside me. Put yourself on this rock. When my glory passes by, I'll put you in the cleft of the rock and cover you with my hand until I've passed by. Then I'll take my hand away and you'll see my back. But you won't see my face. God spoke to Moses, cut out two tablets of stone just like the originals and engrave on them the words that were on the original tablets you smashed. Be ready in the morning to climb Mount Sinai and get set to meet me on top of the mountain. Not a soul is to go with you, the whole mountain must be clear of people, even animals, not even sheep or oxen can be grazing in front of the mountain. So Moses cut two tablets of stone just like the originals. He got up early in the morning and climbed Mount Sinai as God had commanded him, carrying the two tablets of stone. God descended in a cloud and took up his position there beside him and called out the name, God. God passed in front of him and called out, 
God, God, a God of mercy and grace, endlessly patient, so much love, so deeply true, loyal in love for a thousand generations, forgiving iniquity, rebellion, and sin. Still, he doesn't ignore sin. He holds sons and grandsons responsible for a father's sins to the third and even fourth generation. At once, Moses fell to the ground and worshipped, saying, Please, O Master, if you see anything good in me, please Master, travel with us, hard-headed as these people are. Forgive our iniquity and sin. Own us, possess us. And God said, As of right now, I'm making a covenant with you, in full sight of your people I will work wonders that have never been created in all the earth, in any nation. Then all the people with whom you're living will see how tremendous God's work is, the work I'll do for you. Take careful note of all I command you today. I'm clearing your way by driving out Amorites, Canaanites, Hittites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. Stay vigilant. Don't let down your guard lest you make covenant with the people who live in the land that you are entering and they trip you up. Tear down their altars, smash their phallic pillars, chop down their fertility poles. Don't worship any other god. God, his name is the Jealous One, is a jealous god. Be careful that you don't make a covenant with the people who live in the land and take up with their sex and religion life, join them in meals at their altars, marry your sons to their women, women who take up with any convenient god or goddess and will get your sons to do the same thing. Don't make molten gods for yourselves. Keep the feast of unraised bread. Eat only unraised bread for seven days in the month of Abib, it was in the month of Abib that you came out of Egypt. Every firstborn from the womb is mine, all the males of your herds, your firstborn oxen and sheep. Redeem your firstborn donkey with a lamb. If you don't redeem it you must break its neck. Redeem each of your firstborn sons. No one is to show up in my presence empty-handed. Work six days and rest the seventh. Stop working even during plowing and harvesting. Keep the feast of weeks with the first cutting of the wheat harvest, and the feast of ingathering at the turn of the year. All your men are to appear before the Master, the God of Israel, three times a year. You won't have to worry about your land when you appear before your God three times each year, for I will drive out the nations before you and give you plenty of land. Nobody's going to be hanging around plotting ways to get it from you. Don't mix the blood of my sacrifices with anything fermented. Don't leave leftovers from the Passover feast until morning. Bring the finest of the firstfruits of your produce to the house of your God. Don't boil a kid in its mother's milk. God said to Moses, Now write down these words, for by these words I've made a covenant with you and Israel. Moses was there with God forty days and forty nights. He didn't eat any food, he didn't drink any water. And he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant, the ten words. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai carrying the two tablets of the testimony, he didn't know that the skin of his face glowed because he had been speaking with God. Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, saw his radiant face, and held back, afraid to get close to him. Moses called out to them. Aaron and the leaders in the community came back and Moses talked with them. Later all the Israelites came up to him and he passed on the commands, everything that God had told him on Mount Sinai. When Moses finished speaking with them, he put a veil over his face, but when he went into the presence of God to speak with him, he removed the veil until he came out. When he came out and told the Israelites what he had been commanded, they would see Moses' face, its skin glowing, 
and then he would again put the veil on his face until he went back in to speak with God. Moses spoke to the entire congregation of Israel, saying, These are the things that God has commanded you to do. Work six days, but the seventh day will be a holy rest day, God's holy rest day. Anyone who works on this day must be put to death. Don't light any fires in your homes on the Sabbath day. Moses spoke to the entire congregation of Israel, saying, This is what God has commanded. Gather from among you an offering for God. Receive on God's behalf what everyone is willing to give as an offering, gold, silver, bronze, blue, purple, and scarlet material, fine linen, goat's hair, tanned ram skins, dolphin skins, acacia wood, lamp oil, spices for anointing oils and for fragrant incense, onyx stones and other stones for setting in the ephod and the breastpiece. Come, all of you who have skills, come and make everything that God has commanded, the dwelling with its tent and cover, its hooks, frames, crossbars, posts, and bases, the chest with its poles, the atonement cover and veiling curtain, the table with its poles and implements and the bread of the presence, the lampstand for giving light with its furnishings and lamps and the oil for lighting, the altar of incense with its poles, the anointing oil, the fragrant incense, the screen for the door at, the entrance to the dwelling, the altar of whole burnt offering with its bronze grate and poles and all its implements, the wash basin with its base, the tapestry hangings for the courtyard with the posts and bases, the screen for the courtyard gate, the pegs for the dwelling, the pegs for the courtyard with their cords, the official vestments for ministering in the holy place, the sacred vestments for Aaron the priest and for his sons serving as priests. So everyone in the community of Israel left the presence of Moses. Then they came back, everyone whose heart was roused, whose spirit was freely responsive, bringing offerings to God for building the tent of meeting, furnishing it for worship and making the holy vestments. They came, both men and women, all the willing spirits among them, offering brooches, earrings, rings, necklaces, anything made of gold, offering up their gold jewelry to God. And anyone who had blue, purple, and scarlet fabrics, fine linen, goat's hair, tanned leather, and dolphin skins brought them. Everyone who wanted to offer up silver or bronze as a gift to God brought it. Everyone who had acacia wood that could be used in the work, brought it. All the women skilled at weaving brought their weavings of blue and purple and scarlet fabrics and their fine linens. And all the women who were gifted in spinning, spun the goat's hair. The leaders brought onyx and other precious stones for setting in the ephod and the breastpiece. They also brought spices and olive oil for lamp oil, anointing oil, and incense. Every man and woman in Israel whose heart moved them freely to bring something for the work that God through Moses had commanded them to make, brought it, a voluntary offering for God. Moses told the Israelites, See, God has selected Bezalel son of Uri, son of her, of the tribe of Judah. He's filled him with the Spirit of God, with skill, ability, and know-how for making all sorts of things, to design and work in gold, silver, and bronze, to carve stones and set them, to carve wood, working in every kind of skilled craft. And he's also made him a teacher, he and Oholiab son of Ahizamach, of the tribe of Dan. He's gifted them with the know-how needed for carving, designing, weaving, and embroidering in blue, purple, and scarlet fabrics, and in fine linen. They can make anything and design anything. Bezalel and Oholiab, along with everyone whom God has given the skill and know-how for making everything involved in the worship of the sanctuary as commanded by God, are to start to work. 
Moses summoned Bezalel and Oholiab along with all whom God had gifted with the ability to work skillfully with their hands. The men were eager to get started and engage in the work. They took from Moses all the offerings that the Israelites had brought for the work of constructing the sanctuary. The people kept on bringing in their freewill offerings, morning after morning. All the artisans who were at work making everything involved in constructing the sanctuary came, one after another, to Moses, saying, The people are bringing more than enough for doing this work that God has commanded us to do. So Moses sent out orders through the camp, men, women, no more offerings for the building of the sanctuary. The people were ordered to stop bringing offerings. There was plenty of material for all the work to be done. Enough and more than enough. Then all the skilled artisans on the dwelling made ten tapestries of fine twisted linen and blue, purple, and scarlet fabric with an angel cherubim design worked into the material. Each panel of tapestry was 46 feet long and 6 feet wide. Five of the panels were joined together, and then the other five. Loops of blue were made along the edge of the outside panel of the first set, and the same on the outside panel of the second set. They made 50 loops on each panel, with the loops opposite each other. Then they made fifty gold clasps and joined the tapestries together so that the dwelling was one whole. Next they made tapestries of woven goat hair for a tent that would cover the dwelling. They made eleven panels of these tapestries. The length of each panel was forty-five feet long and six feet wide. They joined five of the panels together, and then the other six by making 50 loops along the edge of the end panel and 50 loops along the edge of the joining panel, then making 50 clasps of bronze, connecting the clasps to the loops, bringing the tent together. They finished it off by covering the tapestries with tanned ram skins dyed red, and covered that with dolphin skins. They framed the dwelling with vertical planks of acacia wood, each section of frame 15 feet long and two and a quarter feet wide, with two pegs for securing them. They made all the frames identical, 20 frames for the south side, with 40 silver sockets to receive the two tenons from each of the 20 frames, they repeated that construction on the north side of the dwelling. For the rear of the dwelling facing west, they made six frames, with two additional frames for the rear corners. Both of the two corner frames were doubled in thickness from top to bottom and fit into a single ring, eight frames altogether with sixteen sockets of silver, two under each frame. They made crossbars of acacia wood, five for the frames on one side of the dwelling, five for the other side, and five for the back side facing west. The center crossbar ran from end to end halfway up the frames. They covered the frames with a veneer of gold, made gold rings to hold the crossbars, and covered the crossbars with a veneer of gold. They made the curtain of blue, purple, and scarlet material and fine twisted linen. They wove a design of angel cherubim into it. They made four posts of acacia wood, covered them with a veneer of gold, and cast four silver bases for them. They made a screen for the door of the tent, woven from blue, purple, and scarlet material and fine twisted linen with embroidery. They framed the weaving with five poles of acacia wood covered with a veneer of gold, and made gold hooks to hang the weaving and five bronze bases for the poles. Bezalel made the chest using acacia wood, he made it three and three quarters feet long and two and a quarter feet wide and deep. He covered it inside and out with a veneer of pure gold and made a molding of gold all around it. He cast four gold rings and attached them to its four feet, two rings on one side and two rings on the other. He made poles from acacia wood, covered them with a veneer of gold, 
and inserted the poles for carrying the chest into the rings on the sides. Next he made a lid of pure gold for the chest, an atonement cover, three and three quarters feet long and two and a quarter feet wide. He sculpted two winged angel cherubim out of hammered gold for the ends of the atonement cover, one angel at one end, one angel at the other. He made them of one piece with the atonement cover. The angels had outstretched wings and appeared to hover over the atonement cover, facing one another but looking down on the atonement cover. He made the table from acacia wood. He made it three feet long, one and a half feet wide and two and a quarter feet high. He covered it with a veneer of pure gold and made a molding of gold all around it. He made a border a handbreadth wide all around it and a rim of gold for the border. He cast four rings of gold for it and attached the rings to the four legs parallel to the tabletop. They will serve as holders for the poles used to carry the table. He made the poles of acacia wood and covered them with a veneer of gold. They will be used to carry the table. Out of pure gold he made the utensils for the table, its plates, bowls, jars, and jugs used for pouring. He made a lampstand of pure hammered gold, making its stem and branches, cups, calyxes, and petals all of one piece. It had six branches, three from one side and three from the other, three cups shaped like almond blossoms with calyxes and petals on one branch, three on the next, and so on, the same for all six branches. On the main stem of the lampstand, there were four cups shaped like almonds, with calyxes and petals, a calyx extending from under each pair of the six branches. The entire lampstand with its calyxes and stems was fashioned from one piece of hammered pure gold. He made seven of these lamps with their candle snuffers, all out of pure gold. He used a 75-pound brick of pure gold to make the lampstand and its accessories. He made an altar for burning incense from acacia wood. He made it a foot and a half square and three feet high, with its horns of one piece with it. He covered it with a veneer of pure gold, its top, sides, and horns, and made a gold molding around it with two rings of gold beneath the molding. He placed the rings on the two opposing sides to serve as holders for poles by which it will be carried. He made the poles of acacia wood and covered them with a veneer of gold. He also prepared with the art of a perfumer the holy anointing oil and the pure aromatic incense. He made the altar of whole burnt offering from acacia wood. He made it seven and a half feet square and four and a half feet high. He made horns at each of the four corners. The horns were made of one piece with the altar and covered with a veneer of bronze. He made from bronze all the utensils for the altar, the buckets for removing the ashes, shovels, basins, forks, and fire pans. He made a grate of bronze mesh under the ledge halfway up the altar. He cast four rings at each of the four corners of the bronze grating to hold the poles. He made the poles of acacia wood and covered them with a veneer of bronze. He inserted the poles through the rings on the two sides of the altar for carrying it. The altar was made out of boards, it was hollow. He made the bronze wash basin and its bronze stand from the mirrors of the women's work group who were assigned to serve at the entrance to the tent of meeting. And he made the courtyard. On the south side the hangings for the courtyard, woven from fine twisted linen, were 150 feet long, with their 20 posts and 20 bronze bases, and fastening hooks and bands of silver. The north side was exactly the same. The west end of the courtyard had 75 feet of hangings with 10 posts and bases, and fastening hooks and bands of silver. Across the 75 feet at the front, 
or east end, were twenty-two and a half feet of hangings, with their three posts and bases on one side and the same for the other side. All the hangings around the courtyard were of fine twisted linen. The bases for the posts were bronze and the fastening hooks and bands on the posts were of silver. The posts of the courtyard were both capped and banded with silver. The screen at the door of the courtyard was embroidered in blue, purple, and scarlet fabric with fine twisted linen. It was thirty feet long and seven and a half feet high, matching the hangings of the courtyard. There were four posts with bases of bronze and fastening hooks of silver, they were capped and banded in silver. All the pegs for the dwelling and the courtyard were made of bronze. This is an inventory of the dwelling that housed the testimony drawn up by order of Moses for the work of the Levites under Ithamar, son of Aaron the priest. Bezalel, the son of Uri, son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, made everything that God had commanded Moses. Working with Bezalel was Oholiab, the son of Ahizamach, of the tribe of Dan, an artisan, designer, and embroiderer in blue, purple, and scarlet fabrics and fine linen. Gold The total amount of gold used in construction of the sanctuary, all of it contributed freely, weighed out at 1,900 pounds according to the sanctuary standard. Silver the silver from those in the community who were registered in the census came to 6,437 pounds according to the sanctuary standard, that amounted to a bika, or half shekel, for every registered person aged 20 and over, a total of 603,550 men. They used the three and one quarter tons of silver to cast the bases for the sanctuary and for the hangings, 100 bases at 64 pounds each. They used the remaining 37 pounds to make the connecting hooks on the posts, and the caps and bands for the posts. Bronze The bronze that was brought in weighed 4,522 pounds. It was used to make the door of the tent of meeting, the bronze altar with its bronze grating, all the utensils of the altar, the bases around the courtyard, the bases for the gate of the courtyard, and all the pegs for the dwelling in the courtyard. Vestments Using the blue, purple, and scarlet fabrics, they made the woven vestments for ministering in the sanctuary. Also they made the sacred vestments for Aaron, as God had commanded Moses. Ephod they made the ephod using gold and blue, purple, and scarlet fabrics and finely twisted linen. They hammered out gold leaf and sliced it into threads that were then worked into designs in the blue, purple, and scarlet fabric and fine linen. They made shoulder pieces fastened at the two ends. The decorated band was made of the same material, gold, blue, purple, and scarlet material, and of fine twisted linen, and of one piece with it, just as God had commanded Moses. They mounted the onyx stones in a setting of filigreed gold and engraved the names of the sons of Israel on them, then fastened them on the shoulder pieces of the ephod as memorial stones for the Israelites, just as God had commanded Moses. Breast Piece They made a breast piece designed like the ephod from gold, blue, purple, and scarlet material, and fine twisted linen. Doubled, the breast piece was nine inches square. They mounted four rows of precious gemstones on it. First row, carnelian, topaz, emerald. Second row, ruby, sapphire, crystal. Third row, jacinth, agate, amethyst. Fourth row, beryl, onyx, jasper. The stones were mounted in a gold filigree. The twelve stones corresponded to the names of the sons of Israel, twelve names engraved as on a seal, one for each of the twelve tribes. 
They made braided chains of pure gold for the breastpiece, like cords. They made two settings of gold filigree and two rings of gold, put the two rings at the two ends of the breastpiece, and fastened the two ends of the cords to the two rings at the end of the breastpiece. Then they fastened the cords to the settings of filigree, attaching them to the shoulder pieces of the ephod in front. Then they made two rings of gold and fastened them to the two ends of the breastpiece on its inside edge facing the ephod. They made two more rings of gold and fastened them in the front of the ephod to the lower part of the two shoulder pieces, near the seam above the decorated band of the ephod. The breastpiece was fastened by running a cord of blue through its rings to the rings of the ephod so that it rested secure on the decorated band of the ephod and wouldn't come loose, just as God had commanded Moses. Robe They made the robe for the ephod entirely of blue. The opening of the robe at the center was like a collar, the edge hemmed so that it wouldn't tear. On the hem of the robe they made pomegranates of blue, purple, and scarlet material and fine twisted linen. They also made bells of pure gold and alternated the bells and pomegranates, a bell and a pomegranate, a bell and a pomegranate, all around the hem of the robe that was worn for ministering, just as God had commanded Moses. They also made the tunics of fine linen, the work of a weaver, for Aaron and his sons, the turban of fine linen, the linen hats, the linen underwear made of fine twisted linen, and sashes of fine twisted linen, blue, purple, and scarlet material and embroidered, just as God had commanded Moses. They made the plate, the sacred crown, of pure gold and engraved on it as on a seal, holy to God. They attached a blue cord to it and fastened it to the turban, just as God had commanded Moses. That completed the work of the dwelling, the tent of meeting. The people of Israel did what God had commanded Moses. They did it all. They presented the dwelling to Moses, the tent and all its furnishings. Fastening hooks. Frames. Crossbars. Posts. Bases. Tenting of tanned ram skins. Tenting of dolphin skins. Veil of the screen. Chest of the testimony. With its poles. An atonement cover. Table. With its utensils. And the bread of the presence. Lampstand of pure gold. And its lamps all fitted out. And all its utensils. And the oil for the light gold altar, anointing oil, fragrant incense, screen for the entrance to the tent, bronze altar, with its bronze grate, its poles and all its utensils, wash basin, and its base, hangings for the courtyard, its posts and bases, Screen for the gate of the courtyard. Its cords and its pegs. Utensils for ministry in the dwelling, the tent of meeting. Woven vestments for ministering in the sanctuary. Sacred vestments for Aaron the priest. And his sons when serving as priests. The Israelites completed all the work, just as God had commanded. Moses saw that they had done all the work and done it exactly as God had commanded. Moses blessed them. God spoke to Moses, on the first day of the first month, set up the dwelling, the tent of meeting. Place the chest of the testimony in it and screen the chest with the curtain. Bring in the table and set it, arranging its lampstand and lamps. Place the gold altar of incense before the chest of the testimony and hang the curtain at the door of the dwelling. Place the altar of whole burnt offering at the door of the dwelling, the tent of meeting. 
Place the wash basin between the tent of meeting and the altar and fill it with water. Set up the courtyard on all sides and hang the curtain at the entrance to the courtyard. Then take the anointing oil and anoint the dwelling and everything in it, consecrate it and all its furnishings so that it becomes holy. Anoint the altar of whole burnt offering and all its utensils, consecrating the altar so that it is completely holy. Anoint the wash basin and its base, consecrate it. Finally, bring Aaron and his sons to the entrance of the tent of meeting and wash them with water. Dress Aaron in the sacred vestments. Anoint him. Set him apart to serve me as priest. Bring his sons and put tunics on them. Anoint them, just as you anointed their father, to serve me as priests. Their anointing will bring them into a perpetual priesthood, down through the generations. Moses did everything God commanded. He did it all. On the first day of the first month of the second year, the dwelling was set up. Moses set it up, he laid its bases, erected the frames, placed the crossbars, set the posts, spread the tent over the dwelling, and put the covering over the tent, just as God had commanded Moses. He placed the testimony in the chest, inserted the poles for carrying the chest, and placed the lid, the atonement cover, on it. He brought the chest into the dwelling and set up the curtain, screening off the chest of the testimony, just as God had commanded Moses. He placed the table in the tent of meeting on the north side of the dwelling, outside the curtain, and arranged the bread there before God, just as God had commanded him. He placed the lampstand in the tent of meeting opposite the table on the south side of the dwelling and set up the lamps before God, just as God had commanded him. Moses placed the gold altar in the tent of meeting in front of the curtain and burned fragrant incense on it, just as God had commanded him. He placed the screen at the entrance to the dwelling. He set the altar of whole burnt offering at the door of the dwelling, the tent of meeting, and offered up the whole burnt offerings and the grain offerings, just as God had commanded Moses. He placed the wash basin between the tent of meeting and the altar, and filled it with water for washing. Moses and Aaron and his sons washed their hands and feet there. When they entered the tent of meeting and when they served at the altar, they washed, just as God had commanded Moses. Finally, he erected the courtyard all around the dwelling and the altar, and put up the screen for the courtyard entrance. Moses finished the work. The cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of God filled the dwelling. Moses couldn't enter the tent of meeting because the cloud was upon it, and the glory of God filled the dwelling. Whenever the cloud lifted from the dwelling, the people of Israel set out on their travels, but if the cloud did not lift, they wouldn't set out until it did lift. The cloud of God was over the dwelling during the day and the fire was in it at night, visible to all the Israelites in all their travels.